meeting tonight is Wednesday, December 2nd, and this is the Hendrick Hudson School Board of Education meeting. Can I get a motion to call the meeting to order, please? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we will be moving into executive session at this point. Um, we'll convene for the purposes of collective negotiations under the Taylor Law, medical financial credit or employment history of a particular person or corporation, or matters leading to the appointment or employment history of a particular person or corporation, or matters leading to the appointment or employment or promotion or demotion or discipline or suspension or removal of a particular person or corporation. Um, can I get a motion to move into exec, please? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. For the public, we'll be back at about 7 p.m. We'll see you then. Good evening. Today is Wednesday, December 2nd, and this is the Hendrick Hudson Board of Education meeting. We've just left our executive session and we're back in public session now. Um, we are going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, here we go. Okay. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, our first order of business is to approve our agenda as stated. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, are there any items that are going to be pulled from the consent agenda this evening? Allie? Um, under the uh, fiscal, I wanted to pull the budget transfers just for a little bit of clarification. Okay, why don't we just pull that whole section? It'll be easier. So we'll pull fiscal 3.2. Um, can I get a motion to approve the rest of the consent agenda as stated, please? So moved. So moved. The second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so fiscal 3.2 is our only item that has been pulled. Um, Allie, you had a question about the budget transfers? Um, Nothing specific. There's just lots of large sums on there. So if Enrique could just run us through um, uh, some of the details. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> what happens is that uh, I start the budget in early November. So I'm already working on the budget for next year. And when I do my budget, we always I always suppose that the same number of teachers are going to be in the same places under the same account codes. So as the year progresses, we approve the budget, but then during the summer there's changes. So just to give you an example, if you were a third grade teacher and you become a fifth grade teacher, I have to capture you specifically. So I need to transfer your, your name, account number, how much you, you make from one account to the other one. So there's a lot of changes in between the time that we approve the budget and when we start school. I, this is like a one-time issue that you see so many. Little by little, maybe we'll see a couple of changes. If, for example, Joe tells me we need to hire another teacher or we're moving one teacher from one place to the other one, then we move the teacher with the account code where she's going. And this has been specifically true since last year and this year when the government started the ESA accounted, accounting, I'm sorry, which means that I have to account all the money by building. So they can see that there's equity among the distribution of money among all our buildings. So 
for example, if a teacher moves uh, a teacher moves from one building to the other one, I have to capture that, even if it's basically the same salary. If there's any change in salary, I even if it's a dollar, I need to capture that change, and that's how I do it by capturing each person in each of the buildings. So okay. if you look at this, everything has to be with salaries. Either teachers, teacher assistants, teacher aides or monitors, and it's the switching from one place to another one or one building to another one. Okay, thank you. Um, did anybody else have any questions about fiscal 3.2? Okay, then I'm just going to point out again that we approved our budget calendar for the year. So for the public, there are um, budget presentations at most of our meetings coming up in starting in January. Um, if there are any budgets that you're particularly interested in or would like to comment on, those are the meetings to, att to attend or to write in your comments about. Um, and also there are dates on there for school board trustee election deadlines as well. So important dates coming up. All right, so can I get a motion to approve um, fiscal 3.2? So moved. Can Lisa? I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that brings us to our superintendent's report. Hey, thank you everyone. Good evening and, and welcome. I have a, a number of updates that I put on the agenda and I'll try to go through them uh, quickly but thoroughly so we can um, get to our committee reports and, and our guest uh, presenter. So just wanted to remind everybody, our board and, and community, uh, sort of what schools do and how schools respond uh, with regards to COVID. So I'm going to go out of order a little bit. <clears throat> I'm going to start with 5.2, uh, responding to COVID positive cases. So uh, we have asked families to report positive COVID cases as well as staff uh, directly to their supervisor. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we created COVID specific email addresses, basically a COVID hotline where if a staff or a, a student tests positive, they can send an email to one address and that email goes out to key staff uh, within the school and within the district that need to know. For every single COVID positive staff or student, we have an obligation to report it every day to the New York State Department of Health. That is a, a secure website that only uh, I have access to. And every day we report uh, our attendance and we report whether or not we have COVID positive staff or students in our five schools. That data goes to New York State. New York State puts that on the, on the report card. So the district has absolutely no involvement with that dashboard except for reporting positive cases. And I, I really wanna underscore that. When we have a positive case that impacts staff and students in school, um, superintendents also have a hotline and I'm looking over at my hotline numbers um, where we can speak with an administrator in the Westchester County Department of Health. Uh, and oftentimes that leads to a conversation with a Department of Health doctor, specifically epidemiologists. They are on call 24 seven. I have been on the phone with epidemiologists on Sunday nights, uh, early Friday mornings. Uh, actually it was an early Wednesday morning. They advise the school district on how to respond to each positive case. No two cases are the same. And the reason they're not the same is because there are too many variables to make them the same and too many variables to make the district's response the same. Uh, for example, when did the individual test positive? Did the individual test positive with or without symptoms? When was uh, the last time the individual was in school, a classroom, uh, a bus, you name it? Who were they in contact with? And contact for purposes of our district and schools are same classroom, same bus, basically enclosed spaces. Uh, 
And we identify that information. We review that information with the county health department. So uh, we ask parents for more than just uh, that they tested positive. We also ask them for proof they tested positive uh, and that we send their lab report also to the Department of Health. So every time someone tests positive, we send the lab report. We send uh, basic information on the individual name, address, phone number, and date of birth. Oftentimes, the health department registers um, those positive cases first. They hear from us before they even get the lab report that goes from a third-party testing company to a doctor's office uh, to the Department of Health. So oftentimes, they hear about the positive case from us first, which is why New York State has asked school districts to be the first response in communicating positive cases. Um, I want to give an example of, of how uh, no two cases are the same. An individual tests with symptoms, significant symptoms on, um, I'll make it up, November 23rd. That test comes back negative. The symptoms persist. The individual seeks a second test and that individual tests positive the second time. We receive notice of the positive. So we have a couple pieces of information the lab report that they tested positive, when they tested positive, whether or not they tested positive with symptoms, and the last time they were in school, on a bus, classroom, you name it. In this particular case, because the individual showed significant symptoms on the 23rd, although that individual tested negative, the recommendation from the health department is to treat that negative as a positive because of the severity and the, and the appearance of symptoms. So there's some time lapse between a positive report and when the individual tested initially. So we then, um, based on the recommendation of the health department, we look in the rear view mirror uh, anywhere between two days and four days to say, okay, when was that person symptomatic and when could they have um, basically been contagious and spread it to others? And based on those criteria, the health department will advise us on how far back to go for contact tracing. So if the individual happens to be a classroom teacher, we have to identify every child in that class and every adult that had an interaction with that classroom teacher for at least 10 minutes over the course of their symptomatic or infectious period. Let's say the individual is a student who tests positive. We do the four, uh, 48 hours to 96 hours of um, looking in the rear view mirror, so two to four days. And we identify students who were on that bus for more than 10 minutes. We identify students in the classroom for more than 10 minutes after school program, every adult. And what's different this year is that students are not moving in the elementary school classroom to classroom. The teachers come there, the art teacher, the music teacher uh, come to the classroom. So if a student tests positive in a classroom and we have to, um, quarantine all of those students. We have to quarantine every adult that was in the room for at least 10 minutes. So it's, it's very easy um, to wipe out large groups of staff and large groups of students just for one positive case. And the number that we have to identify for contact tracing and quarantining is based on those criteria and based on those data sets that we give the Department of Health they advise us and we are the first level of communication. For every child and adult that we contact and tell them that they have to quarantine, we send that information back to the Department of Health and we tell them name of student or staff, address, phone number, uh, sometimes date of birth, when the last contact was. There's a spreadsheet that the Department of Health gives us that we complete for every contact. And that takes a long time um, because we have to reach out to those families. We have to identify their information on our computer system. Uh, and we have to go back through the schedule of the day to see who else was in that room or bus or you name it. So I, I certainly appreciate, especially now uh, in the last month, let's say, with the huge increase in positive cases regionally, but notwithstanding our district, 
that that there is a level of frustration that um, when you get an email from the superintendent, it's likely to tell you your school is closed. Um, but that is not a decision the school district unilaterally makes. We make it based on uh, all of those criteria and all of that information and at the direction of the County Department of Health. So that's why a school may close for one day or no days or three days. It all depends on that criteria. And the reason we close school is to make sure that we basically have a timeout, that we don't have kids coming to school that shouldn't be because we couldn't conduct contact tracing. We also close school to make 100% certain that we uh, do a thorough and, and deep clean of all of the, um, the entire facility uh, to make sure that no one can get infected because we didn't clean. So that timeout is very, very important. Uh, it, it gives everyone a break. It allows contact tracing to start. And let me tell you, I am on the phone uh, with our team who, who is on uh, this call and with the school principals and the secretaries trying to identify oftentimes at the worst time of day, eight o'clock on a Sunday. Um, we had to uh, close the high school a couple weeks ago um, based on a positive report that we received at 530 in the morning. Uh, we had to turn around middle school kids because we received a positive report at 9 a.m. Um, and, and we have been trying to, you know, prepare for this uh, throughout the summer and, and the fall to say that these decisions are going to be quick. They're going to be a gut punch because they're going to happen at the absolute wrong time. Um, but the decisions are being made uh, for the health and safety of our kids and in our staff and health and safety of, of our of our classmates and um, and our colleagues. So I, I completely appreciate and I understand the frustration and the constant emails and the updates, um, but that communication is required. We believe everyone should know what's happening um, and that th the cases are real. Um, we have had to close two schools now for the remainder of the week because of the number primarily because of the number of staff that are ineligible to teach because they are in quarantine uh, and cannot come to school. And also the high number of students who are quarantining or, or ill and can't come to school. And that is an absolute last resort canceling school. The good news is, is that we've, we've worked on our remote model. We spent a lot of time, as all of you know, in the fall, um, improving it and trying to perfect it to the extent we can. We're improving our instructional practice and our technology and our hardware and our software. You'll hear in a little bit from, from two uh, really dynamic and outstanding kindergarten teachers who are teaching kindergarten remote online. Um, it is not easy, it's not preferable, but it's the environment we're in. And uh, our response to positive cases is consistent with other districts. Uh, every Monday, uh, superintendents throughout the region have a, a weekly phone call with the county executive and his health department officials to talk about these things. Um, and so I just wanted to use this opportunity one more time to, to let people know the, um, the mechanics and the decision making uh, process that we go through and that oftentimes, if not all the time, the decision is not ours, it's at the um, it's at the uh, disposal of the of the health department. But every single uh, positive case that we know about, we report. Um, and every positive case that results in a school closure, and every case that results in having to quarantine adults or children, um, is consulted with the Westchester County Department of Health. So I know I talked a lot, but this is a, a really important topic, and I know. Um, I know we're stressed and we're frustrated and, and, you know, people are going to bed tonight, not knowing if we're going to have school tomorrow. And I don't know either. I don't know if I'm going to open an email or get a phone call saying that someone tested positive uh, and, and the process starts over again. Lisa Shookman a couple days ago, got an email that someone tested positive and we drop everything and we deal with it. So there is no, um, there's no method to the madness, but it's the situation we're in and, and we try to get information out as quickly as possible so families can try to have as much time to make some uh, important decisions and, and these are decisions around supervising their kids. So I, I, we, we hear you, uh, we understand um, the situation, um, but 
you know, oftentimes these decisions are, are not the school districts. They're not Joe Hockwriter's decision. Um, they're decisions that are vetted with, with the medical professionals because that is, that is not our core competency, that's them. And for the first time you know, ever, schools uh, are, are reliant on the medical community to determine whether or not we can open our doors. So let me just hit pause and see if, if um, any of the board has, has questions about that really quick before I move on. Bill, go ahead. To touch on one of your comments, Joe, do how do parents notify the district if their child tests positive, like say they get the results over the weekend or at night after school hours? How does a parent report it and are the parents aware of it? Yeah, so it started with call your principal. <laughs> call and email your principal. And, and that worked for a little bit until we realized that the cases were growing and that COVID positive cases don't happen between nine and five, Monday through Friday. Um, so what we ended up doing a few weeks ago was we created an email address specific to each of the five schools um, that we've put out a number of times and we'll continue to, to articulate that, where parents can say, uh, or staff, you know, my son or my daughter or myself have t has tested positive, the lab results are attached, or I'm waiting lab results. And that email goes to more than a handful of, of people that can respond quickly. So it's not a fax that's sitting on a desk on a Saturday morning and we don't get to it until Monday morning. It's not a phone call that's sitting on someone's voicemail. Um, you know, we're responding to these 24 seven. So the last number of, of COVID positives have come through that email hotline. So we've been able to respond and, and a number of us are, are nodding our heads because we get those emails. Um, we're able to respond quickly uh, because we're all checking our email all the time. <laughs> but that, that's how we've tried, to, we've tried to shorten the window between notice of a positive and us being able to respond to it. And parents are aware of this? We've sent it out to them uh, probably two or three times, but we'll continue to to remind them. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Does anybody else have questions before we move on? This is, um, if one child at one of the elementary gets it, why does the whole school have to shut down? For, for a couple of reasons. First, I'm, we, I'm just asking that because people have asked that. Yeah. Yeah. So for a couple of reasons, first, we need to, I, we, we, I'll use the timeout example. We need to separate everyone so we can understand who would be considered a contact of that child to make sure they don't come back to school um, and, and potentially infect others and to make sure that um, the staff in the school can go through the register of who was in that classroom, what adults were in that classroom, what children were there. Um, what children were on the bus in the morning and the afternoon was that child in the after school or, 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 or before school program. Uh, and it gives us time um, to get it right once. Uh, and by closing the school, it limits uh, the ability for potentially infected people to come back, which just widens the, you know, widens the net. The second reason is because um, we're mandated to do a thorough cleaning of the school um, with uh, state approved chemicals that have, uh, you know, a, a greater propensity to kill the virus if it's present uh, on, on any, uh, you know, piece of furniture or, or anywhere in the, in the school. Thank you. Allie? Question about the, the cleaning. So the cleaning that's happening on a regular basis, we're not using, or we are we using the virus killing? Yeah, we're using the virus killing um, everywhere. <laughs> uh, uh, however, um, there are, there are additional cleaning agents um, that are used when we did, when we are confirmed of a positive, and so it's basically a belt and suspenders approach. It's um, you know, it's, it's comforting. It makes people feel better. Like, okay, they didn't just, you know, do the 3 PM post dismissal cleaning. We sent a team in, you know, um, they did it a second time or they, you know, maybe did it the third time. So it's, it's mostly an, an insurance and, uh, and assurance. Um, but, uh, we can have Anthony Merlini talk about the, you know, the different products. They're all approved by New York state. They're on the state list, uh, for us to purchase, 
Um, they, they have met the CDC or Department of Health requirement to, you know, kill the virus yet be safe um, for students, but it's mostly assurances. It's giving additional assurances that it's not just part of a routine cleaning, that it's, um, it's purposeful and um, kind of more, more, more of a dedicated, um, a dedicated act rather than just part of the custodian's routine. Lisa? I was wondering, Joe, if um, I know that we have confidentiality, you know, things that we have to be careful about, but isn't it, isn't it possible to provide a little bit more information to parents and to families about, you know, maybe this particular person was in, last in school on this particular date? I know we did that one time in one of the emails that I received, but can we provide a little bit more information or is that Really not possible. Uh, um, the, 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 the communications that we send out, and I know all of you have received them, there's a communication saying there was a positive case, we need to close the school, contact tracing will commence, and then there's a communication we send out after contact tracing so everyone can, okay, if, if they didn't call me, I'm not, I'm not involved and I can go about my daily business. Those were communications that were recommended to us by the Department of Health when we started this process back in the, back in the fall. Um, the immediacy of it is to make sure families know there was a positive and that there's no school so that folks could, could start to make plans B, C, and D, you know, to, to give them notice whether they need childcare or so on and so forth. Um, any of those other details, it doesn't change, it doesn't change our response and doesn't change any of the decision-making. Um, I'm not, I'm just personally not aware of, of other districts that, that name the place and the date of last contact um, because that could also always change too. Um, for example, um, I, I referenced the, the example where the individual tested negative on the 23rd and then positive on the 30th. Um, if, if we commit to a specific time, date and location, but then realize after the fact um, that the individual was symptomatic, then that window of going back 20, 48 hours goes an additional 48 hours. And to commit ourselves to a very narrow window of the investigation for the contact tracing, um, I, I, you know, it just sort of boxes us in a little bit when the purpose of the communication is to let folks know there's a positive, we're, we're taking a time out, and we're, you know, as thoroughly and quickly as possible trying to identify everyone who could be at risk. Um, I, I, I could ask, I could, I could ask to see um, what other schools do. I know once in a while I'll get memos from other school districts because of, you know, BOCES is closed or, you know, um, because we share services there. I know Lisa um, gets notices from other schools because we have, we have kids from other districts that pay tuition, um, but we can look at them. I just... I don't, I don't know that it, it, it doesn't change any calculus in terms of a decision that we have to make based on the guidance from the health department. Okay. That, that's Thank all. I, Thank you very much. Okay. Um, my next COVID related update is cluster zones. So um, in response to, I think, feedback uh, that the governor received last spring around the statewide closure and, and painting the state with a wide brush when there were different zones and infection rates, um, New York State has come up with what they call cluster zones, uh, which is um, a state response to targeted communities with certain infection rates. And there are three zones, yellow, orange, and red. Um, yellow is is trouble and orange is more trouble and red is high alert. So that's the continuum. Um, part of this uh, new initiative by the governor is um, a requirement that if schools want to remain open in a community with a high infection rate, the school can remain open if they conduct testing. This is a complete 180 from the Department of Health's recommendation back in, in August and September. In August and September, the Department of Health advised school districts against testing students and staff. And the reason they advised against it is because there weren't enough tests and a significant delay in getting the results. So there has been a, 
a paradigm shift uh, with with the governor or his team that we're now moving to if you want to stay open uh, well let me go back if you want to close and use your remote model you can because we have that option now that that's an option for our school year um, is we could be fully remote all year if we wanted to no questions asked and the state you know will will accept it so in uh, in a yellow zone if uh, you are a yellow zone, if Hendrick Hudson is a yellow zone or, or uh, Westchester County is a yellow zone, um, we, in order to stay open for in-person instruction, we would need to test a certain percentage of our students and our teachers and that the infection rate from those tests would have to be lower than the infection rate of the community. Now, the trick is, or the, the, the fine print, is who pays for the tests? The school district. The school district pays for the tests and the analysis of the tests. Now, COVID tests now is only about 25 bucks. The analysis of a COVID test is between 100 and 150. So um, in order to stay open in a yellow zone, the school district would have to test 20% of their students who come to school and 20% of their staff that come to school randomly every two weeks. So you, you get to 100% of your staff over a 10 week period. In order for the school district to test 100% of our staff and our students in the yellow zone would cost between 350 and $450,000 for every one cycle of tests. All right. So a lot of districts said, well, that's great. We can stay open if we test, but now the, the responsibility of testing is on the school district and, and, and it's, it sort of sounds, sounds and looks like an unfunded mandate. The issue is the pressure is to keep your schools open. And the only way to keep your schools open in the yellow zone is to test. Uh, parents would have to give consent um, and someone has to pay for the tests. And under the current language right now, the school district would have to pay for that, uh, pay for the tests. Um, Enrique has been working with uh, his, his colleagues uh, across the region, um, trying to see, you know, basically uh, um, to buy in bulk and to uh, do this as a shared service. They've been trying to negotiate an agreement uh, with um, a testing company and analysis company um, that that basically we would farm this out to. Um, think of it this way: we would have a we would have a group of of nurses come into the district somewhere, set up a testing center, uh, like maybe some of you have gone through, and we would have we would have clipboards and we would identify who needs to be tested. We would give them a test. We would identify whether or not they were positive. We'd report it to the county, and they would determine if if school could be open. All right. In an orange zone, schools must close immediately. And then in order to reopen, you have to test 100% of your people. So it's not 20% random every so often, it's 100%. And everyone, uh, the infection rate of, of testing 100% needs to be below the infection rate of your local community. Still, the school district would be paying for that. Now, we anticipate uh, any moment now, literally any moment now, um, the governor making adjustments uh, to those criteria. Um, we're not quite certain what those adjustments will be, but he gave every day he's he's giving a little bit away. Um, the infection rate in schools is lower than the infection rate in communities. The governor wants to keep schools open. In order to keep schools open and people feel comfortable, he wants to have a testing mechanism. School people like me and Lisa, who supervises PPS and Enrique and Laura and Margaret and everybody, um, that is not what schools do. Schools are not a COVID test center. Our school nurses um, are not um, testers. <laughs> uh, we, don't, we don't have that staff. That's not our core competency. And that's why a lot of districts, when they were identified as a yellow zone, they closed in order to figure out what the next best alternative is. And the next best alternative is to partner with a company that does this professionally um, so that we can go about teaching and learning and they can go about testing. And I don't want to I don't want to harp on this because I, I believe we're, we're going to receive some some uh, change in the guidance. 
Um, but one of the unintended consequences of this plan is that if we had a testing center in the school, if we had kids come down to the nurse's office to test them and a child tests positive in the school nurse's office, what would happen is that child goes immediately in the quarantine or into isolation. And everyone in the last 48 hours that child has come in contact with now needs to quarantine, including classmates, the teacher, the bus driver, the kids on the bus. So what inevitably will happen by testing children in a school is we're going to have positives and then we're going to close the school because we have a positive case in the school because we're testing in the school. And that was feedback that that superintendents gave the governor and hopefully the governor is taking that under advisement. Um, our recommendation would be, if I could just fast forward of, of how Hendrick Hudson could handle this, is that the testing would need to be done offsite outside of school hours and the and the best time that would be the least impactful on instruction would be to test between 3 p.m. on Sunday and 8 a.m. on Monday. And, and I know that's a very narrow window and that sounds goofy, but the reason we would wanna test in that window is because if anyone tested positive that did not have symptoms and we use the 48 hour rule to go back to see who they were in contact with, it's highly likely that they weren't in the school, weren't on a bus, weren't in front of kids. And that would be the only way that we would be able to have, um, have it both ways, that we could be open for instruction and test, is we would have a very narrow window to test without having to then close the school and quarantine. So the, the 30,000 foot view and, and vision of this is sound, and um, it shows that the governor has, has heard feedback from families and community members from last spring, but um, there are also a lot of holes in the plan, which is why we're anticipating a change in this again at any moment. I don't know what it will be, but you know, thankfully right now we're not a yellow zone. Um, I believe, to be honest, from just what, what I know of, of an infection rate in the state is that we're probably as a state creeping toward a, a, an orange zone statewide. Um, you guys know it because we keep closing schools and having to close them because of infection rates. So um, that's just another wrinkle in this whole system um, that schools have sort of increasingly become an arm of the health department and now have become an arm of the medical profession. Uh, and I get it. We have a uh, you know, we, we, we have the customers right in front of us and families want their schools open, but there, there are some pretty significant consequences um, to using your school as a testing center. And that's just one of them because for every child or adult that tests positive, it's at least 48 hours in the rear view mirror um, of who needs to quarantine and, and actions we need to take. So there's a long winded answer to um, a, a plan that just probably wasn't as vetted as we would prefer. So let me let me hit pause there before I go on the staffing shortages and then we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll move on. Anybody have comments or questions? It was a very thorough presentation, Joe, thank you. Sadly, we're becoming better at this, but. <laughs> so what would be our plan? If they designate us immediately, does that mean we say, no, we're gonna test or are we shutting down? What, what are we doing? Well, we would, in a, in a yellow zone, current language is you have to shut down. You have to shut down to basically take a time out, like I said, and get your testing plan together if we choose to. All well, right? that's what we, I'm asking. What yeah. are we choosing? What will we choose to do? The choice that we will have under the current, under the current regulations, let's say um, there is no anticipated change. The, the conversation we would have um, as a team is Enrique would present um, Enrique would would basically present a, a financial analysis to say in order for our schools to stay open uh, and test twenty percent every other week or a hundred percent based on our designation, um, do we want to be remote for a little while and see if this passes, or do we want to try to open our doors quickly and um, having it having a an agreement with a testing company to the tune of 350 to 
But that's what I'm asking. Have we made this decision? Like, don't, shouldn't we like make the decision before that day comes? Like, well, what are we going to do? So are we going to test or are we going to, and spend that money? Or are we going to close for a few days? So currently Enrique and his, his business counterparts are, are working through BOCES um, on that to make sure that there are vendors that have enough tests that um, can run the full operation of a, of a testing center um, and have the capacity to give us the results in a, in a meaningful time frame. Um, we would then have to have an emergency board meeting to approve that contract in order, in order for that to start. Um, the, are, these the not the, are these not rapid tests and using saliva instead of that, right? The, the type of test, that's, why, that's what I heard. That's what we, the, thought the type school. of test right now under the current regulations, um, is any COVID test, any approved COVID test. Um, now the rapid tests are not as accurate. Right. Um, the non-rapid tests are certainly non-rapid. They take anywhere between three and five days, but right. are more accurate. Um, I, I don't know, Enrique, if, if your group has gotten this specific, I don't know if the cost is any different for the rapid or the, the swab test, but it's, um, from my understanding, it's not the cost of the test. It's, it's the, the, the analysis of it, the, the lab part of it, even the exactly. mobile lab. Uh, my understanding is that the actual cost of the swab and the test is, is close to zero is everything else transporting it to the lab the lab checking it the lab doing the test and that's what it's costly that's why uh, it the the cost will be depending if we can get enough tests from the county for free if that were the case it's going to be about 120 to 150, meaning that the, 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 the cost of the test is very little. It's the process that costs the, the, that costs money. Now we, we'd only have to test the kids who and the staff who are coming into school, right? Not the fully remote? Correct. Yes. And, and, what's, and, the, and what's the legality of that, of forcing somebody to take a test? That's you know what I mean? Like, like uh, I already heard teachers saying, not not here, because I haven't spoken to any of them, but they're going to refuse to take a test. So then what happens? So we need to look at the legality of forcing people to take a test. That's going to be, wait till this hits the courts. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. So if that's the case, then we got no other choice but to close. Some of, some of the- uh... At least for the first- it's 20% every two weeks. Right. The problem is that it's random. So it's someone that says, no, we don't know what will happen. Uh, 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 I haven't gotten any answers. Let's say that 20% is 100 people. And 10 people say, uh -uh, I don't want this and you cannot make me do it. Then I don't have the... I don't have the 20%. I cannot pick another 20% because this was random. So I, I really don't know. I don't think they, they thought about this problem at all. I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with so you, you, Enrique. They did not think <laughs> What are the other, so there's other um, districts in Westchester that are in the yellow zone right now. What are they doing? Are they just on remote? Uh, many of them are remote. Uh, Peak skill is remote until after January. Um, Port Chester has been remote. Yeah. Um, Ossining has just started testing. Ossining is a little different that they have, they have uh, already, well, they have a well-established health center in their schools um, to support students and families. So it's my understanding what they did was they expanded um, the staffing of that health center to include uh, testing. Um, but it's basically, a, it, it's a model that they already had. Um, they're just expanding access to it. Um, but, but for the most part, districts that don't have that infrastructure already have closed. Um, and, and they've closed because of the concern that the investment that they would make in testing would not increase the amount of time students would be in school. You know, that's why I, that's why I got hyper specific and, and a little goofy about saying, 
the best time to test that would not impact school closures would be, you know, one minute after dismissal. Uh, well, it, it would be a minute after dismissal on a Sunday. So 3.01 PM, let's say until kids show up Monday morning. Otherwise you, you create that unintended consequence. When we have, if we had a student, like I said, if we had a student test positive in an elementary school, um, and the nurse said, oh, Johnny or, you know, Jimmy, you're positive. That kid goes to isolation. The school basically goes on momentarily lockdown so that we hit a timeout with kids in the school. We notify parents, we isolate everyone, and it becomes like a mass unit. Um, so now, again, an, an unintended consequence of a well-intended um, initiative to try to, you know, keep kids safe and keep staff safe by identifying who may or may not be positive. But for every positive case, we have to go through that whole um, detailed uh, dance that I, that I talked about earlier. So a lot of districts, long, again, another long winded detailed answer. A lot of districts are saying we'd rather wait it out. You know, we, we'd rather wait it out than, than spend the money on testing when we know we're going to get more positives that will only create more absenteeism. Bill? Joe, you keep wording it in the positive with the testing. You know, if we test below the average of the surrounding community during a yellow, then we can stay open. But given the school district is part of that community, assuming a, a, a consistent average throughout the community, chances are we're going to test at what the community rate of yellow is and we're not going to be able to stay open am, am i missing something or that, that's correct there there's a risk i mean there there's a risk i mean risk reward and that the investment that we would make all right four hundred thousand dollars to try to stay open um could could just confirm that we have a pretty significant infection rate. And that's, you know, that's one of the issues about, about children or young adults is that they could be, they could have it and be asymptomatic and not know it. Well, well now we know it, which means we have to close school. Um, and, and that is, that's, that's the risk reward or the opportunity cost that districts and boards are, are really discussing. Um, Peak skill decided that that was not a good use of their resources. Again, unbudgeted, you know, um, basically an unfunded mandate and a threat, you know, we're not closing your schools, says New York state, you're closing your schools because you're not testing. It's your choice, not the governor's. And a lot of districts are in that camp bill that, that the intent of testing is sound, but the consequence might be greater. And Thanks. also remember that the cast to happen every two weeks. So let's say that this week, we we test below so we're open for two weeks but what about the next 20 percent so then the in in we open for two weeks and then we need to close i'm sure timing is a big issue too because if we go in a yellow zone the week before our winter break then Obviously, it's it's probably better to close than to start getting the testing um, machine in order, shall we say. I just think we need to have this discussion so that we're ready and it doesn't come upon us. And quite frankly, with all the talk about the vaccines, I don't think it would be, if I can voice my opinion now, the best use of our money to spend $400,000 on testing when there'll probably be a vaccine within a couple of months. Uh, that's just my opinion. But Plus, parents are not going to be sending their kids to school, and I don't know. I just think we should right. probably get ahead of ourselves and make our decisions so that if we are faced with it, we're ready to do that. Yeah, I think we'll have to see what the governor says about what he's tweaking, too, because what he's been saying is that they're prioritizing K through 8 to be open, and then um, nine through 12 less of a priority. So maybe the testing is gonna be changed that if you wanna keep the high school open, then you have to test, who knows? I don't know what he's gonna say. Hmm. All right, anything else on that before I talk, <laughs> talk about one last piece? Um, 
staffing sh shortages. So as as we had commented throughout the, the summer and the fall that there'd be many reasons why school would be closed. Positive tests um, or we wouldn't have staff. And, and I use the analogy, we wouldn't have staff to drive the bus, clean the school or teach our kids. And that um, happened upon us uh, at BV and also happened upon us earlier today uh, at the high school. Um, it's not in response to COVID positives. It's in response to because of COVID positives before and the significant number of staff and kids that are out, but I'm talking about staff now, um, we don't have eligible people to teach. And the, the discussion that we had with, with Margaret and Lisa and Laura and myself and both, both principals and some of their key staff was what we can guarantee is a, ro a robust educational experience remote with assurances than having a revolving teacher or hope that we would have an adult that could supervise kids in a classroom. And that really was the calculus. What, what is the best educational experience kids would receive given 20 plus teachers out at both schools, the staff that, that substitute for the teachers are also out or not available, or we don't have enough monitors to supervise the kids when they eat lunch or before school or after school. Uh, and it was, you know, one of the hardest decisions we had to, we had to make in this whole um, conundrum, but um, we felt that uh, with enough notice and um, some really dynamic teaching that you've heard about and that you'll hear about again tonight that we felt it was, it was best to give parents that notice um, and that time to prepare for a multi-day um, uh, school closure using the remote model. And we're not the first district that this has hit. Um, Peekskill has closed for significant periods of time, overstaffing, Yorktown, Lakeland, uh, I can name them all because they all have done it. And uh, unfortunately, this week was our first um, time we had to make that decision at BV yesterday for the rest of the week. And we made the decision earlier today for the high school. Um, it, it's around available staff and it's around safety and, and supervision. And um, it's not because we have widespread infection rates in those schools, but it's because of COVID positives that people are quarantining. Um, it's because people who are symptomatic should not be coming to school. Uh, and, and they're staying home and they're getting COVID tested and they're waiting for their results. Uh, so we felt it was best in those circumstances based on the uniqueness of those schools and their academic program, um, based on the specific staff who are going to be out. For example, um, we have 65 to 70% of a particular high school department is going to be absent the rest of the week. Um, and, a, and a department that provides very significant services to kids. We, um, we felt it was best to be remote so those kids could still have an academic experience, albeit remotely, but it would be, um, it would be a better experience than trying to piece something together, having them come to school. And it's not going to be our last time. Um, it's just a nature of the virus. And we don't have to, we don't have to look far to see the, um, see that other schools are making similar decisions. But you know, again, those are decisions with health and safety in mind. But I wanted to make sure I had an opportunity to just uh, uh, re revisit and reinforce that. Does anybody have questions about the staffing issue and et cetera? All right, so with the board's permission, I'd like to swap our committee reports and maybe push them to the end where we usually have new business and um, board comments and we'll just do them then so that we can do our presentations and discussions next. I think we have some very patient teachers who have been sitting and uh, watching this very interesting meeting and perhaps they would like to um, do their portion so that they can get to their own families and children. So we are really, really um, excited to, to share um, inside the classroom, uh, the virtual classroom of Marissa Dietry and Janine Rizzoli. Uh, both of these fine educators um, are normally Frank G teachers, but now they are just kindergarten teachers because they have kids from all different neighborhoods in their classroom. 
and they are full remote teachers at the elementary level. Um, a, a very, very new and um, stressful yet exciting opportunity that uh, we were able to provide our, our kids and our families dating back to August. And um, I, I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't hear from parents about about their, their children's experience and especially kindergarten children who for, well, kindergarten children whose first educational experience is this. Uh, and for some families, their first educational experience for their children is this. So it, uh, we're, we're just, um, we, we, we couldn't be happier with, with how it turned out uh, and, and two really dynamic and energetic and creative teachers. And I'll turn it over Margaret to real quick, real quick to just review how we got to the elementary remote model. And I've been talking too long. I need to grab a drink. Good evening, everyone. Um, so as Joe said, you know, in the beginning in August when we were uh, deep in the weeds with planning to reopen in September, we didn't have a whole lot of information from the state about remote options for parents. So we had th the, a thought over here about what it potentially could look like, but we hadn't put anything in place. Once we knew that we had to offer that to our parents, um, we quickly scrambled to get that uh, model in place at the elementary level. And I must say that, and I've said this before, and I will continue to say it while we are experiencing our COVID situation, uh, I do believe that we've been very fortunate in Hendrick Hudson for two reasons. Number one, because we are lucky enough to have our elementary children every day, all day, and because our 11 remote classes are staffed by some of our best teachers. And that really just is the way it happened. And, and we're very fortunate about that. So tonight I have the great privilege of sharing with you a few moments in the lives of Mrs. Dietry and Mrs. Rizzoli, two of our excellent kindergarten teachers. And I was thinking while I was listening to Joe, uh, Janine is the current grade level leader and Marissa was the grade level leader prior to her. So we have some leadership in those positions as well. They have embraced this opportunity and truly made the best of it. Uh, I was speaking with them the other day in planning for this and I felt like I was in their classrooms and you'll see that in their backgrounds tonight. So without further ado, if they're still on this call because I can't see them on my display, I am going to turn it over to Marissa Dietry and Janine Rizzoli. Thank you, ladies. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having us tonight. Um, we hope to bring you a little ray of sunshine after that first portion of the board meeting. <laughs> Hopefully a little positivity. <laughs> it was a little, it's a little heavy, a little heavy act to follow. Um, but Marissa and I just wanna introduce ourselves for those of you that don't know us. I'm Janine Rizzoli. Um, you may recognize me. I used to be Miss Tafeman for a really long time. Um, I've been teaching, this is my 18th year teaching, 15 years in the Hendrick Hudson School District. I've taught kindergarten first, third. I taught reading AIS for a couple of years and now I'm back in the classroom. Um, kindergarten's my favorite, it's a special, a special place for me. Um, I myself personally, I have a nine-year-old special needs son in fourth grade in a district up north in Dutchess County. Um, participating in a hybrid model. And um, it wasn't an easy decision to put in for remote, but I'm very happy I did. This was um, a good choice for me. Okay, and I am Marissa Dietry and I started in Hen Hud about 13 years ago. Um, and I've spent majority of my time here teaching kindergarten. I am also a Hen Hud graduate and a parent in the district. Um, I currently have a second grader and fourth grader who are remote. Um, so I am living this remote world on both ends and I'm extremely grateful. Um, both my children are having wonderful experiences with um, Mrs. Powell and Mrs. Maldonado. So um, it's just been a really great experience. Next so slide. Three, Mr. Go ahead. <laughs> So our remote teachers, as Margaret said, are some of the most amazing colleagues that we've had the privilege to work with over the years. Many of them we've worked with at Frank G. Um, we've worked with them across the district and they are just amazing people. In spite of everything that's going on in the world around us, our, our colleagues are doing 
are moving mountains. They're doing amazing things. Um, additionally, our colleagues in person are doing amazing things too, but these are our remote teachers that we have the privilege of working with every day. And they're just fantastic um, personally, professionally, um, and we're very excited about working with them this year. It's really nice to work with people consistently across the three elementary schools. Next slide. So this is a Bitmoji classroom. If you don't know what that is, Bitmoji is a big thing. It blew up in the spring. The teachers make different classrooms and they have thematic rooms. And so it's December. So we made a Bitmoji classroom. Sometimes we add different books that kids can listen to or read um, when they're not online with us. We have different libraries set up. Um, many of the remote teachers and um, our colleagues that are in person have these set up too. But if you were ever wondering what a Bitmoji classroom is, this is what it looks like. Um, I change mine monthly depending on what's going on that month. Last month we were uh, set up for Thanksgiving. So this is our December classroom. This is the all all of those um, covers, all the books are, the kids can click on them and it will bring them to a read aloud. So a lot of those stories we're reading in class and if they wanna reread or pre-read, um, they have access to that. All right, so tonight Janine and I are gonna specifically talk about the day in, uh, a, a typical day in remote kindergarten and you know, when we were planning for this, we were thinking about the other grades and kindergarten being so unique um, already in person, it's a totally different world um, than you know the older grades. Um, we have you know some four-year-olds, five-year-olds who don't have much experience with technology. So we're kind of running this as if the kids were right in front of us. Um, you know, we're not using our breakout rooms daily. A lot of times, if you pop into our remote classrooms, you'll see us holding a dry erase board or um, holding up a center card and asking the kids to hold up their dry erase board. So uh, it definitely looks a little different. But one thing that is the same is our schedule. We're pretty much all following the same schedule K through five. Um, the day starts with morning meeting. Both Janine and I have a leader in class or an engineer, we call them. And that child is helping us with the calendar, with um, what the weather is today, counting the days of school. So similar activities to what we would be doing in person. We have three blocks. So we are focusing on reading, writing, and math. And all three of those blocks start the same way. We are with the, the whole uh, class first, and that's when we're delivering our mini lesson. And then the students are going off and working independently or staying with us for small group instruction. Now, a lot of our groups are, <clears throat> excuse me, heterogeneous. So during that small group work, that's when the most important um, instruction is happening. We're really giving targeted direct instruction um, to our kids based on their needs. Of course, with the little ones, uh, we have to have a lot of movement breaks. You know, kindergartners will tell you when they've had enough. <laughs> so sometimes we have a few more than normal and, and whatnot, but, um, you know, they're, uh, they'll definitely let you know. <laughs> um, we incorporate show and tell. We're incorporating our science and social studies. Um, you'll pop onto our classroom and you'll hear us singing, you know, the thankful song or... Um, you know, anything. We're always singing. Um, always and, singing. I feel bad for those parents at home. <laughs> and the day uh, always ends with our office hours. And that's when Janine and I are pulling our small groups. Um, sometimes it's one-to-one. -one, sometimes it's three in one. Sometimes we're doing skills. Sometimes we're doing a little guided reading. It really depends on what the kids need. Um, and sometimes we're meeting with parents. There may be some things going on. So um, that is a really valuable time that we have and um, it, it changes every week for us. The one thing about this remote schedule and the remote experience is that it provides consistency for our students. So there's no worry about, I mean, yes, there's tech glitches here and there. You get a few kids that get, can't log in or the Wi-Fi is not working too well, but 
the consistency has been the most important part, one of the most important parts. And the other, mo the other part that I think is the most important um, is the communication, which is so important because the parents are really, we're really relying on them to help us out through this experience. And they've been phenomenal. So the consistency and the communication is a real, are two real huge points in um, helping us to make this be as successful as you know we're finding it to be. So next slide. So Marissa and I are constantly planning with each other um, using all of the same materials and curriculum as we would be using in school. And we've been using foundations. Um, as you can see our letter chart here, it might look a little different to you because um, it's interesting. They don't reckon, they didn't recognize each other at the beginning of the school year. So we tried a million different ways to try to get them to recognize um, their friends in our class to promote classroom community. We changed the alpha, I changed the alphabet chart so that instead of saying B, bat, B, they say B, Ben, B, so that they know who their friends are in their class. And it's really been effective. We provided, um, you know, uh, class lists for them with their friends' names and pictures on it. Um, we've made different, um, you know, books to co um, emergent books that they could um, read with their pictures in it. So um, it's a very personal experience. Um, Marissa's going to speak so a little bit about the guided reading. Yes. Yeah, so, and just to touch a little bit on the, the reading workshop, we are um, using the TC units and we're adapting them to the remote model. Um, but something that all the kids have are independent book bins. So this is something we use in person and it's something that every remote student has, but inside those book bins, um, they have a bunch of different independent reading materials. So like Janine said, we have a class name chart where it has the child's picture and their name so that they can get to know each other. We have our alphabet chart, a bunch of different alphabet charts, um, some environmental print books, we're doing, um, we're making class books so that they can read um, sight words and have pictures, our kindergarten family book, and it's upside down, sorry. Um, you know, I see whoever, and a bunch of mini readers. And so in these book bins, the kids are independently reading and they're using the strategies that we're teaching during the mini lesson. And, you know, at first, it, it was funny to watch them. And, and you can see some of the pictures that are on this presentation. They, from the beginning of the year to now, it's been awesome. And the parents have been saying it too. You know, those first few days they'd open the book and okay, done. What's next? And now, you know, the parents are seeing them flip through the pages. They're seeing them um, find sight words. They're seeing them retell familiar story, you know, retell their favorite story because they've heard it so many times. So you know, that's the feedback we're getting from the parents and it's, and we're seeing it too. And it's just, those book bins have been a wonderful tool for the kids at home. And um, more, uh, and importantly, the book bins, but also um, the learning A to Z subscription that we have as a district has been a real, um, thank goodness for learning A to Z. I really, I'm so glad we, we lost it for a little bit, but we got it back because it's been a lifesaver for our guided reading groups and for teaching targeted skills to students um, remotely, especially during our guided reading time. Sometimes if I do a, a shared reading, um, you could actually download the book and post it so that if they're not gonna log into their Raz Kids account, they could see it, the parents can print it out. Um, it's been, it's, uh, and I plan on using it more as, as our students become um, more fluent readers. We're, we're seeing it, it's, it's coming together and usually usually starts to come, it starts to click around this time. It takes the first three months of kindergarten in person and it's really starting to, uh, to click now. So um, it's that time of year. So next slide. So these are just some of the, some pictures of um, some of the things that we do. As I, as I mentioned, um, using RAS Kids for um, guided reading, reading A to Z. Um, we had a lot of professional development with uh, Linda Weinbaum. So using read alouds with emergent texts, um, practicing sight words, repetitive language, um, so that they become more fluent and they can read independently when they're not on with us. Next slide. This is more small group instruction with decoding and um, phonetic work, doing a lot of rhyming, a lot of word families, um, 
This is, I'm using as a document camera, I'm using one of my son's um, devices. It's called an Osmo. Laura Nair, you might want to look into that. It's a really great tool because it could double as a hands-on um, in-person tool, but then if you're ever remote, you can turn it into a document camera. And I think it's only $50, I don't know, but something to look into. Very cool tool. Next slide. All right, so moving on to writing workshops. So each day the children um, have writing workshop and it's it begins the same way we, we would have done it in in-person, uh, a mini lesson based on what the children need. This week specifically, we did a lot with phonetic spelling and labeling and stretching out our words. So it really depends. In the beginning of the year, I was doing a lot of mini lessons on illustrations and just how to draw a person and, and adding details. So um, those mini lessons are based on the class. Um, we are still conferring. We're, we're using what we learned from Carl Anderson, and it's looking a little different in the remote world, but um, it's happening during our small group. And you know, I could do maybe three or four conferences a day and they could be totally, totally different or the same based on the child and their work and what goal we're looking at. Um, we're always, always trying to incorporate handwriting and letter formation. And this is a good time to um, do it when they're, they're writing their books or uh, labeling their pictures. Um, and we're, you know, we're uh, tweaking the interactive writing because we want to make sure that gets done. And it obviously looks a little different in the remote world too. We can't really share a pen. We, we can as, as once they learn a little bit more of, of the um, technology, but um, so far so good. And they're, they're enjoying bookmaking and um, we are just finishing up our narrative study. I know Janine's a little bit ahead. She, um, she'll talk a little bit about her nonfiction, but we're moving into nonfiction, which is one of their favorites. Go ahead, next slide. Nonfiction, I think, is my favorite genre of writing to teach. Um, and the kids seem to have a lot of success with it. And I like to spend a little extra time on it because they're very confident. They become experts. I have my little expert sign here. So we started to like dabble in it before Thanksgiving. So we did um, nonfiction turkey writing and we made a chart and we read emergent texts. And, um, you know, it was, it was real fun to do a book together and label the pictures and illustrate and um, we're working on how to find those um, words in text so using the chart to like copy so they would like oh how does this kindergartner spell the word turkey well we can find it in our text and we can copy it how did you know we used a chart that said turkeys are turkeys can turkeys have so when they can, they're, they've been identifying their sight words, they can find those words in on a chart or in a text and they can use that as a resource to help them. They also have um, little word walls at home um, that I've sent home. There's one behind me that I have here, but they um, get the, we, I sent home the words for them to have access to. So some parents have actually put them on the wall. Some parents had word walls before kindergarten even started. So, um, we're doing well with that and um, with our reading and writing skills because one kind of lends its hand to the other. So um, they're coming along. It's, it's really impressive. I'm really like very proud of them. Next slide. Um, math is um, moving along nicely. We have a bunch of new tools this year that we've been using, which is Zern and um, Boom Cards, which I'll speak about in, in just a minute. Um, we are sticking to our year at a glance curriculum guide as a district because if some of these kids do go back to school in January or February, um, they need to be in the same place as their in-person peers are. So we are constantly communicating with our colleagues. We're constantly collaborating with them and checking in to make sure that we're kind of all staying aligned with each other and making sure that if I have a student that goes back to Furnace Woods at the end of January, that they're at the same place or maybe we're even a little bit ahead. Um, we're using our Eureka Math program and um, Marissa, I, I don't, I'm not sure if you use this as much as I do, but I found the um, Embark website to be a fantastic a professional development resource for myself to help me uh, focus in on my learning targets for students and to really help 
um, create lessons that are visual for the and engaging for the kindergartners because you know their attention span is fleeting. So um, we try to do everything we can, including costumes, masks, trinkets, whatever whatever we got, we use. I've got my soup. I got my got stick, superpowers tape. Um, and we use our, our informal and for, our informal and formal assessment data and the learning standards to drive our instruction. Um, and this is just an image of Boom Cards, our, our special ed department and Margaret got us a subscription to Boom Cards for the, the primary grades, um, I believe in K and one. And these are engaging, they reinforce skills during independent time. And, and while, the, while the kids are having a great time, we are collecting data on where to take our instruction. So we get a print, like a, a spreadsheet of, if, did kids get all these right? Did they get a 70%? How, how well did they understand the content that we delivered? Um, so, I, I mean, we use it in all subject areas, reading, mostly reading and, and math. But um, this is just an example of how it was a little challenging to teach measurement remotely. So we made it work. Um, we, turned, we turned hangers. Kids were walking around their houses with solo cups and hangers and string and they were measuring things. Monday, we were doing a lesson on uh, capacity. They were, I had water all over my kitchen table. I was like, I'm sorry, parents. <laughs> I'm sorry, they're gonna make a mess. <laughs> make sure you have paper dowels. But you, we have to get the learning target across. We have to get the, um, you know, we have to deliver the instruction. We have to think outside the box when we're teaching remotely. So next slide. We also use some, I'm a little more techie than Marissa, <laughs> um, but I'm not, I don't, it's, I mean, the technology is like, we try to keep it whew, uh, limited because it could get a little complicated for the littles. Um, but I was teaching a lesson on, do I have enough? And uh, we use, I use Jamboard a lot to um, incorporate some thematic elements and, um, you know, I try to keep the engagement high. So I use pictures of things that they would enjoy. Sometimes I even throw in pictures of them. Like, you know, there's five cookies and I have, you know, seven Noahs. Does Noahs have enough cookies? To eat? You know, it's like, you're trying to keep their, them interested in their attention. And it could be a little challenging sometimes, but um, you make it work. That's all it's about is making it work and um, just keeping them excited about learning. So next slide. So I would say probably in October, um, late October, we got the word that we would be adding remote specials to live remote specials to our schedule. And um, it was kind of a, a big undertaking. And if Margaret want, wants to jump in, she could jump into that. But we, um, she was able to get all of our related services to get related uh, special areas together and our principals to put together a quickie live special schedule um, for our remote students tw two, times, oh, two times in a six day cycle. So the students participate in um, music and art live once each in a cycle. And it was a quick transition. We all shuffled our schedules and made it work, but our colleagues that teach music and art, um, they, they really gone above and beyond for making this come to life for our students. And they are moving mountains and are doing great things with our kids. Our kids are excited to go to music. They are excited about art. They show us their artwork when they come on from, you know, come back from, from art after they see Mrs. Spearman or, or Miss Irwin. Um, they, they are happy to sing songs that Mrs. Um, I think we have, we both have Mrs. Hack, right? Mrs. Hack, right. Mrs. Hack right. and Mrs. Corellis are working with the remote students live. Um, and Mr. Frank's kind of helping out in every area. My good friend, Mr. Frank, he's, uh, he's jumping in where needed. And uh, we can't, I can't emphasize enough how much I appreciate these people for helping to give our students the most authentic experience remotely possible. Um, it's a very challenging time and, and their hard work and dedication is really, um, I, I just want to recognize them for helping us out. So yeah, and I, I think it's also important to say how great it's been for the kids too, because you know Janine and I will pop into music and we'll pop into art, and you know Miss Fearman is doing the the finger turkey, and you know Mrs. Hecht is singing the thankful song that you know 
pretty much every you know um, kindergartner throughout the district knows. So it's a great way to connect everything into to the themes that we're doing um, in our classrooms. And so I, know, I, I, pictures. I know that Samantha was teaching them some songs, some thanksgiving, thanksgiving songs that we taught them in our class. So she was excited to see that they knew some of the words and they, you know, it wasn't brand new to them. So um, like I said, we're always singing. So, um, but you could go to the next slide. And this is just some of them participating in the different um, Samantha's. You can see all the kids in, in the class. They're all, they're all in music and you'll see um, Samantha's uh, in the top, top row with her hands up, <laughs> but um, they're, they're very engaged and they really love to join their classes. And that's a Miss, Mrs. Fearman's hand print turkey. turkey hand. Next slide. So the social emotional piece. So we've been really lucky. Um, we have had Mrs. Polito, our school counselor come and visit and she's visited K through five remote. Um, her recent visit was all about breathing techniques and she was talking to the kids about what a big feeling is. Um, and so the kids traced their hand and they turned it into an animal and it provided them with a visual to use this breathing technique to breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. So um, it was quite the hit and the kids can't wait for her to come back. Um, and you know what? We're using it in class. You know, we had, a, I had something happen the other day and I just said, grab your breathing buddy. And, you know, they have it right there. You know, I have mine hanging up too and they're using it. So it's, it's great to see um, how excited they are and that they're actually using strategies that are being taught to them. So we have a unicorn. Unicorn was very popular. <laughs> very popular with this group, unicorns. A lot of all about unicorns book. So finally, um, class community. You know, when we first started thinking about how we were going to um, organize our, our remote classrooms. A lot of us were wondering how was this going to work? You know, back in March, we already had developed relationships with our students. The students had re had relationships with each other. So we were all kind of like, okay, how is this going to work? And, you know, Janine and I have talked about it. I've talked to other remote teachers about it. I see it with my own children. It is so heartwarming to see how the friendships that are being developed, the class community that's being developed, um, to see the kids get so excited in the morning to come on and, you know, hi, what would you do last night? What do you, you know, or what'd you have for lunch? And, um, oh, I like unicorns too. And just so excited. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's just been wonderful, wonderful to see. We um, really, we really wanted to, and, uh, you know, I kind of tried to convey the message of, we really wanted to, provide the most authentic kindergarten experience as we possibly could remotely. Um, it's a, it's a big challenge. Um, it is, it is daunting when we're planning um, every month for the, the next month about, you know, what are we, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to try to keep this as authentic as possible? Because kindergarten is a magical year. And I say this every year at my meet the teacher night, um, it's a magical year. Mag and Margaret will agree. I see her smiling. <laughs> magical things happen in kindergarten. And it is very difficult. It's a very difficult situation any year to send your baby off to kindergarten, but especially in today's climate. Um, so Marissa and I are doing our best to bring them the most authentic experience as possible by celebrating birthdays and holidays and having them do family projects and holiday crafts. My kids, my kids kind of glitter glue this month. The parents love me. <laughs> they did a project. They did a project this morning, but um, it's really important for them to have that experience, even though they're at home for at least part of this year. Right. And, and that's, that's a really good point that Janine brought up. The way that we're organizing our instruction is each month we have a packet pickup or material pickup. So Janine, Janine and I are really, we're looking at, the next month, like we're already starting to think about January and we're planning all of our arts and crafts. We're planning all of our reading and writing, all of our math instruction and the kids will get a packet and there's construction paper. Janine had glitter glue. We have it all in there because we can't assume that anyone has anything at home, you know? So 
we're making sure that we're providing all these materials so that they can, you know, make their bat hands. If you, you know, if you could see the picture or their turkey headbands. Um, we, That's on the next slide. Next yeah, slide. Big turkey headbands. They also did their disguise a turkey project. So we're trying to give them the very best experience possible. This was um, this was my class the week before Thanksgiving. We did they had did, we both did disguise a turkey. It's like an annual tradition that we do. We did a family disguise a turkey project, and a couple weeks before Thanksgiving, we did a big direct draw um, of a turkey, and I gave them watercolors in November. I'm crazy. These parents are gonna kill me. And um, we made turkey crowns, and we just did our best to celebrate our uh, celebrate the holiday and. And you know other special occasions. It's so important that these things are recognized because they're that's what's important to these children. So um, we're doing our best to continue to do those things remotely. Um, and we're also learning a lot about ourselves. I mean, I don't know about Marissa, but I know like I don't think I've ever been so well planned before in my whole career. Like to be like on top of things and planning and to know what I'm doing in three weeks from now. It's been. Um, a, a quite the learning experience. I've learned a lot about myself as a person and a professional in, in a, you know, as a, you know, as a teacher. Um, and and also made you really think about how you're going to change your in-person instruction once we do go back. It's really, it's been a really awesome experience so far. And um, I want to make sure we thank the families too, because, oh yeah, um, you know, they were really trying to work on the independence piece, you know, where I, I keep telling them you wouldn't be next to them if, if they were at school, but they're there if something happens with the Chromebook, they're there if they can't find something, they're helping prep materials at night so that they're ready for the morning. So um, a very big thank you to our families this, for their the, commitment. The, the, yep, the commitment, the collaboration with the families, the communication, all the big, the big C's, they don't, this, this doesn't work as well as it does without the help of the families. And I cannot, I cannot thank them enough for the support that I've gotten and Marissa has gotten too over the last months. It's, it's really, it's really incredible. And we are so beyond thankful. It's hard to find words to express that gratitude. So that is all. We will that stop all. talking. <laughs> Hoping that the, the, the mood has changed a little bit. <laughs> ladies, ladies. So um, really all of our teacher colleagues and some of them may be listening tonight can remember back to March and April and May and June when we were all stressing through every Google Meet about what we were going to find in September with the littlest guys. Um, this is such hard work. It looks like fun, it is fun, uh, but it is so deceptively <laughs> easy um, that a lot of people uh, I think don't appreciate the work that goes into working with children who cannot yet read, who um, it, it is their first experience for many kids. Uh, we have fine motor skills that we're working on. I mean, kindergarten, and Janine said it correctly, is a truly magical place. And um, many of you know that I was, I'm an elementary teacher by trade. I taught kindergarten and pre-K, fourth grade. My heart will always be in kindergarten. I'd go back in a minute to teach. And Marissa was lovely enough to host me as a co-teacher a few years back. So I want to also add on to the thank yous that we're giving out tonight to both of you for uh, coming forward tonight and coming forward to teach this year virtually in what, with one of the most challenging populations in terms of the support that they require. I'd like to thank the parents who we know have to be there to help these children. Um, and, and I know that there's a little bit of what line is crossed, how often, and then what will that look like when that child comes into first grade next year? But I'm, I'm feeling confident. Um, I'd like to thank the three principals who've been outstanding colleagues collaborating with me, brainstorming. Um, we knew in the beginning of the school year uh, when Joe and I were doing all those parent meetings that there's no way that we could have thought of everything. And we certainly didn't. But the collaboration of the team as a whole is what makes this work. So when we saw a gap, 
we worked beautifully together to fill that gap, to brainstorm our needs. I know Janine mentioned a few times and I appreciate that you know we've bought them things. That's our job. Our job at district office is to make their job as easy as we possibly can. So I'm not gonna lie and they will tell you that they've often asked for things and I've said, no, you know, that doesn't make any sense or we don't have any money left. Um, but they do a good job of making their case with really sound educational decision-making. And so we were pleased to be able to provide them with some of the tools that they showed you this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank the special area teachers who, as Janine also mentioned, uh, in October when we said, look, we, we, we've got the live kids in, in the buildings now. We understand how that schedule is working. We know where there are openings for us. How can we bring some live specials to the kids who are at home? And yes, it did require some adjustments uh, at all levels of the organization, but Again, everybody just said, what do you need me to do? And we got it done and it's working. Um, I also wanna thank the kindergarten team as a whole. This is a very strong collaborative team. Uh, they do a great job of getting our babies ready and their dedication and their hard work over the past few years, especially. And again, we heard the names of our consultants. Um, have really changed our practice for the better. We're sending our kids to first grade stronger than we've ever sent them before. And it's because this team knows what they're looking for when they look at their kids and knows how to change and direct their instruction to the needs of the kids that are in front of them. So my hat's off to both of you. Uh, we were able to show the board two extremes. <laughs> uh, so we watched a high school presentation, which just knocked our socks off. Uh, and now we watched how these babies begin. And uh, I, I think uh, my personal opinion is that they've got a great beginning this year under some extremely trying circumstances. So I thank you and I look forward to working with you both the rest of the year. I'm sure we'll find a million other things that we can do together as we move through the winter and the spring seasons. But thank you for tonight. I know we took you away from your families. I don't know if anybody has questions for the two ladies. I just want to say thank you. You two are both consummate professionals. This was amazing, amazing to see. Your your houses look just like classrooms. People don't know the difference. That's fantastic. They think we're in a classroom, but we're really not. I mean, my office looks like a classroom. It looks like a binder blew up, but it's its home. Is it just the two corners of the room or is it the whole room? Oh, it's taken up the whole room and sometimes it takes up the dining room table too. Yes, yes. <laughs> We have our little corner classrooms and then it kind of migrates. <laughs> yes. Thank you both for coming out this evening. Thank you so much um, for having I think us. Margaret covered all the thank yous. I will, <laughs> I will just piggyback on those. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, as a teacher of older kids, I, I so appreciate what you guys are doing. What and I just want to say that this is the hardest I think teachers have ever, ever worked. And we work hard to begin with, but to change our entire model of business at the drop of a dime, where I, I would put it to any other business in the world to try and do what education has done. And you ladies have shown what a tremendous, absolutely tremendous job, because I can't even imagine what it is with little tiny babies at home and trying to get them to do the things that you're getting them to do. But as a whole, for all of the teachers, just to change your entire model of business, being told, this is how we have to do it. And, and we just did it and it, and it happened. Mm -hmm. And it, did we have to make things work and adjustments? Yes, and, and it's exhausting. So thank you so much because I'm freaking tired too. <laughs> well, that's what I, said. I said, I'm more tired when I teach remote than I am when I go to school. <laughs> So, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank I have you to say, in this process, when we first were thinking of these, you know, this, these remote teachers, I think people who were in an education maybe thought, well, everybody wants to be a remote teacher. That's probably the easiest gig out there. I think that was the first impression. Um, not a lot of people wanted to do this because they knew it was really hard. And I, and I just want to echo that again. This is really hard what they are doing. And, you know, like the planning, the organization, 
just managing, especially at this age. So, you know, kudos to both of you and all of the other remote teachers who stepped up to take these positions because it was voluntary. You know, they had, they had to raise their hand and some of them did it hesitantly. Um, and I think they're all loving it now. I think there's a lot of rewards and, you know, like they said, they've learned a lot, but I want people to understand that this is challenging. And like you said, Lori, I mean, they had to completely switch what they were doing. So I think all of our teachers are doing a phenomenal job this school year and everybody's managing it, but you know, this full remote model is quite a challenge. And so I, again, thank the two of you and everybody else that's doing doing the role and, and thank you for taking the positions. <laughs> thank you, Laura. And I mean, any, anybody that's been in our classrooms knows that Marissa and I are like, crazy hands-on we are hugging kissing grabbing like we love our kids they're like they're our babies so this was a very um I mean for me I'll speak for myself this was not an easy decision to make it was an 11th hour it was it's there are some days where I miss being in the room with them and loving on them but I wouldn't be able to do that this year anyway so that was a real big um factor in making my decision I'll just love on them through a screen <laughs> No, and, and it really, like I had mentioned, it's it's really been so wonderful to bond with them. I, I didn't expect to bond with the class the way that I am. And um, their families and their and families. Their families too. Right. It's really nice to have that family involvement, interaction, engagement. It's it's been really nice to get to know them on yeah. a personal we're, level. We're really working as a team. So it, it just makes it that much better every day. Um, getting on the screen, seeing them excited, ready to learn. Um so it's, it's been wonderful. And I'll just wrap up by, um, by saying, as Margaret said, we spent a lot of time trying to put this model together and, and build the plane while we were flying it. <clears throat> but I had the experience of speaking with a lot of families of, of kindergartners who um, were really scared. I mean, we all were scared. We're still a little scared. Uh, you, you heard a 30 minute soliloquy over COVID testing. We're really scared. But, but uh, the parents, um, first time parents, first time their kids coming to school and they're going to an office, a basement or a kitchen table instead of taking the bus, they were, uh, they have been so relieved and they have been just so thankful um, and, and uh, appreciative of, of your effort because um, what, a, what a tough way that we've transitioned public education but especially for the first time kids have, have come to school. And I'm, what I'm really interested in to study down the road that someone else will do, but how much better today's kindergartners who have had this digital experience, whether it's full virtual or hybrid, it doesn't matter, but, but what, what skills are they going to have that were sort of unanticipated in this project that um, we may not have been able to develop if we weren't in this really tough situation, that, that there are some really great things that we'll learn from this. And when we go back to normal 2.0, um, there's a lot of what you've done in your classrooms um, that I know you're going to bring back and, and you're going to have a lot of colleagues who, who are over at Frank G or other schools, you know, asking you how you did it and what it was like. And um, that's really exciting. And, and there is a, uh, you know, there is some hope and there is some uh, positive opportunities uh, that come from this really stressful experience. And thank you guys for stepping up. And on behalf of parents who were calling me all August and early September about not sure what to do, Janine, you mentioned you weren't sure 11th hour. So were the parents. Margaret and I were looking at the ticker of, of families registering for remote and wondering if they even would. You know, a lot of parents were just like, get them in the school so they know what school is like and to have two dedicated classrooms to kindergarten and, and the, um, the praise upon you guys have just been outstanding. So thank you. Thanks for making their experience in Hendrick Hudson as, as a five-year-old so positive in such a, a really tough time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And I, I do want to say too, you know, with my parent hat on that I want to thank the district because, you know, as a parent of two remote students, it was a difficult decision and it's been awesome. The teachers have been wonderful. Everything has been going so much smoother than I ever expected. And, and my kids are happy and they're learning. So right. that is the best thing ever. So thank you um, to all of you. Thank you. Oh, all right. <laughs> <Rest>. <laughs>
Well, you guys don't have to hang around, but you can. Um, but I think we're gonna we're gonna move on. We're sort of are are in the same ballpark of conversation. We we just heard from two kindergarten teachers who are teaching remotely in a remote Princeton plan, and we want to pivot to uh, our organization's work with um, going through a process to determine if moving our elementary model to a Princeton plan is um, something beneficial for our community. It's been a conversation that we've had for uh, many years uh, in the past here in our school district, and uh, it has resurfaced as the district is confronting with um, the closure of Indian Point at the end of this April of 2021. So I'd like to welcome our facilitator and longtime friend and even former administrator in our in our school district, John McCarthy, to the virtual meeting. I'm, I think he's getting set up here. Oh, I'm not in. You're in. Oh. Hold on. Am I, am I there now? There you are. You got it. Okay. I was trying to hide my face, I think. <laughs> So good evening, everybody. It's uh, very nice to uh, be back here in the Hendrick Hudson School District and see the Board of Education. And unfortunately, it's through Zoom. So I'm hoping in the near future, I'll be able to come back and actually be in the in the boardroom and meeting with the board members and the community. Um, tonight, the, excuse me. Good to see you. <laughs> oh, great to see you guys. Yes. I, I, I had to slide my stuff off the screen so I can see the PowerPoint. So I apologize. So tonight, what we're going to try and do is uh, replicate uh, what we did with the stakeholder committee group on the 23rd. I'm going to take you through the process of what they saw and did and also allow you to hear from the, the different administrators and what they presented to the group. So the slide that's up there now um, really talks about the number of people who were involved. It's a good cross section. As you can see on the slide, um, we had staff members, building administrators, parents, community members, and that equaled up to the 34. And then we also had five central office administrators who were um, presenting on that particular uh, day. So in, in all total, we had almost 40 people participating in the Zoom call. And, uh, you know, Janine and uh, Marissa, uh, I give them a lot of credit. You know, having the uh, kindergartners in a Zoom classroom, I just can't even imagine doing that. And I can just tell you personally, um, doing a Zoom meeting with this many people is very challenging and, and clearly not the ideal setting to have a meeting such as this, but this is the world we live in. You know, typically we'd have a uh, a meeting where everybody came to the same room, they'd get all their materials in a folder, we'd be able to have breakout rooms right there. But for this particular meeting, um, we had some challenges, but it was done in the Zoom format. And I can just tell you that uh, under the circumstances, this committee did an excellent, excellent job. Okay, Greg, next slide. So what we intended to do um, for the community members is really to have a couple of takeaways. The first thing is to understand the issues facing our district. And in a couple of minutes, Joe will go through those slides, many of which you've already seen. And that was the case with some of the people that were in the committee. Um, but there was others there that learned things for the first time. And, and that was really important as we start this uh, very difficult work that lies ahead of us. The second thing we wanted to, to do is have them become familiar with the Princeton model. And uh, again, I think Margaret later on will talk about the Princeton model, but again, it was important for us to make sure that they understood the model that we are presenting to them. I also did um, some re uh, survey results. Uh, we had done surveys earlier on in the year and, and during this, the uh, last school year with the teachers. So we went through the results. We allowed them to ask questions and provide us with feedback. And I will tell you, they provided us with some really good feedback and asked us some questions that we had to go back to and start to address them. And then finally, the most important thing is that we wanted them to have the ability to go back to the groups that they represent and provide them with the information and share. And one of the things that Joe has said from the beginning, he wants this process to be very transparent. We want people to understand the issues. So as you guys make the decision on what direction you're gonna move in, everybody is familiar with what's going on um, as it relates to the Princeton plan, the district moving forward. Next slide. So part of the process that we utilized was during the meeting, and I have to thank Greg because he was able to set this up in short order. Um, we had a series of presentations and then the group was broken out into six different rooms. Um, we had the rooms divided by uh, six or seven people. And each of those rooms had a cluster of people that were from different groups that were re represented at the meeting. Um, can you go to the next slide, Greg? And the charge of that group during their time together was to provide us with three important facts that they learned from the presentation. 
to come back to us with two questions that they had based on the presentations that they heard. And then one suggestion to provide us with uh, ways to enhance the presentation as we move forward. This was really critical in this process because getting their feedback, getting them to express to us what things we can do better is the only way to get this information out in a way that's gonna be uh, usable for this, the board and the community. Next slide. So as the board knows, um, I think the world of your mission statement. So I just want you to take a minute to look at the mission statement that's in front of you. Now, during our meeting, Joe went through and highlighted certain phrases or key words that are in our mission statement. And I can tell you again, looking at what Janine and Marissa did tonight and what they're doing during the course of the school year, it is no doubt that they are following this mission and providing the students exactly what they need to be successful. So that's critical as we move forward, when we make a decision that we keep in mind what the mission statement is of this district and what we're charged to do on behalf of the students that we serve. Okay, next slide. So um, we had to tell them the why. And in a minute, Joe's gonna go through some of the really devastating news that happened as a result of the closing of Indian Point. And as I listened to the presentation earlier on tonight with COVID um, and, and what you guys are dealing with with the closing of Indian Point, I will tell you I'm in awe of the work that you guys are doing. So when this first happened, when Indian Point closed down, um, many people inside the community and many more people outside the community really felt that there's no way the district could survive um, Indian Point's closure. And I will tell you from an outsider's point of view, looking in and having the opportunity to work with you guys over the last, uh, you know, I think it's about eight or nine years now, um, not only have you been able to survive, you are thriving. And that is really credit to a number of people. But really, I think, you know, again, under the most difficult circumstances, and they keep coming with the COVID, you guys have the intestinal fortitude to move forward and again, stick to the mission of the district. Next slide. So, we're gonna go back in a little bit of history lesson here, right? And again, when we were able to meet in person and we weren't wearing masks, uh, the board, you know, over two years ago, sat down during a summer retreat and did a SWOT analysis and put together this action plan. And again, thanks to the board, the administration, the staff, the parents, the students, and the community, you have taken steps in these action plans to get to where we are today. So again, I'd like you to just take the opportunity to look through all the different things you've been able to accomplish over the last two years and things that you're continuing to work on as we move forward. And the one that I really want to point out to you, because there's stuff about communication and funding, but the real thing that you guys really, it stood out to me, talked about, was the opportunity to maintain a high quality school district. And again, under the most dire of circumstances, this Board of Education, the administration, the staff, and the community, and the students um, were able to take a dire situation and continue to maintain high quality programs for the students of this district. And that is amazing. And that, that's something not to look past. You really have to take a moment to pat yourselves on the back because that is really remarkable. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. And Joe, yep. you're up. Thank you. Uh, Greg, you can go ahead. Uh, this has been a slide that we have used in many different arenas over the last number of years. It's been used as a advocacy tool. It's been used as um, a way to really get the attention of our community and our elected leaders uh, that we are facing some very significant challenges over the next number of years. Uh, the blue line, of course, at the top is what the pilot payments would have been had Indian Point not closed. And of course, the red line is what the in Indian Point pilot payments are, uh, that they are closing. Indian Point accounts for roughly 30% of our budget, 30%. Uh, three out of every uh, $10 uh, that we receive and that we spend is due to um, the enormity and the significance of the Indian Point pilot payment. And that when Indian Point announced their closure, um, 
there was a lot of tension and a lot of stress in our community. Comments about whether or not our property value will plummet whether people will have a max, mass exodus and there will be an oversaturated housing market, whether or not the school district will go bankrupt or have to merge with a neighboring district just to survive. And as, as John mentioned, uh, this board and the school community um, has supported uh, budgets, uh, supported a budget with a pretty considerable tax increase last year. Um, but we knew that we were not going to accept this. We knew that um, while our reality moving forward financially was going to be different, um, we also had to mobilize our forces. Uh, Greg, go ahead. And we began a very robust uh, advocacy campaign. Uh, we advocated for increased cessation mitigation funds. This is uh, a pot of money in Albany distributed to municipalities that lose a power plant. We were able to advocate uh, over a number of years for at least $24 million more dedicated to the school district. And we're proud to report that the entire cessation fund will be funded by Albany and we will be able to uh, receive all of the money we have due to us. Uh, we worked very, very closely with Nita Lowy, our retiring Congresswoman on various bills in Congress. Uh, many of them I know are gonna be re reintroduced next year. Um, and we'll see what, uh, what a new administration or how a new administration deals with that. Uh, we advocated for an increase, and this might not be popular to say, but with the uh, Westchester County Legislature increased uh, their sales tax by 1%, which generated $600,000 of extra revenue to the school district. We've been partnering with uh, the Area Chamber of Commerce, the um, uh, Hudson Valley Gateway Chamber of Commerce, as well as the town of Cortland with trying to partner with them on business development. And they have made Hendrick Hudson a priority for potential business development opportunities that will create tax revenue that right now does not exist. And annual savings to reduce tax increases. We've been tightening the belt in our district for quite some time. Uh, we have solar panels on our roofs. We have solar lights uh, at Frank G. Elementary School that I'm, I'm pointing to. Uh, we've tried to do cooperative uh, bidding and purchasing and use BOCES for different programs and staff uh, so that we are lessening the burden on our taxpayers and trying to be uh, more fiscally responsible so that we're not just taxing our way out of this problem. So with the cessation fund, uh, $30 million uh, will move to $45 million this year. Uh, these are some of the specifics of being eligible for the cessation fund, which we are. Uh, and so we're thankful that our advocacy efforts and our work with our state senator and assemblywoman, and certainly with the support of the governor, uh, our community is going to be receiving every dollar that it has owed to it. But it's also important that I underscore that the cessation fund is not a one-to-one -one match for outgoing revenue, okay? The cessation fund is to help with significant uh, reductions. So to make sure we don't have a cliff, but a soft landing. The intention of the cessation fund uh, is not to um, replicate tax dollars, it's to uh, help us make adjustments over a period of time. And we're eligible for cessation funds over eight years. Uh, so that gives us some time to make financial adjustments, but it, it is not a one-to-one -one replacement of, of tax revenue from Indian Point. Had we... Um, Gone back to that uh, uh, document of our of our projected uh, revenue loss um, because of our successful. That's okay, Greg. I'm sorry. Um, because of our successful advocacy, uh, the close to 24 million dollars in cessation funds coming to our community is essentially a 57 percent represents a 57 percent tax increase. So while we're all worried about tax increases and we have been uh, for a decade plus, uh, one of the lowest taxed suburban Westchester school districts, we know that will change, but uh, because of this advocacy effort, uh, it's not going to be um, uh, majorly significant, but our advocacy efforts uh, resulted in $24 million of, of revenue coming to Hendrick Hudson and, and that's significant. Okay, Greg. The board took the bold step uh, a few years ago to commission a study uh, for an independent, independent third-party group to review our facilities to determine 
uh, if we can use our facilities differently to save revenue, to find efficiencies in our instructional model. And they found a number of opportunities for the, the board to consider. Of course, the first recommendation was do nothing and just leave it alone. Uh, we've been uh, a pretty high functioning school district for quite some time and uh, an option is always to do nothing. Uh, recommendation number two, uh, a grade level center that's uh, colloquially known as the Princeton plan, where instead of having neighborhood elementary schools, you, students move through the elementary schools in a cohort by grade level. So instead of having school A, B, and C be kindergarten through fifth grade, each elementary school houses two grade levels. School A is kindergarten in one, school B is two and three, and four and five in school C. A third recommendation uh, called for closing an elementary school. And the fourth recommendation also called for closing an elementary school and moving fifth grade to the middle school. Uh, after a review of the finances and uh, a, a, the cost benefit and some of the disruption that it would cause and having to make um, a really important decision of closing a school, which is probably one of the most important decisions a school board can make, um, the board decided to study option one and option two. Basically, leave our program the way it is, three elementary schools um, designed by neighborhood uh, enrollment or recommendation to investigating the Princeton plan. <clears throat> and uh, as John mentioned earlier, uh, we wanted to make sure that the community understood the financial impact of status quo versus the financial impact of adopting the Princeton plan. Now our community has had this conversation uh, many, many times over the last number of decades about potentially moving to the Princeton plan. And for many reasons, some that I've been told, but I don't know for certain because I wasn't here, um, we, never, we never made that uh, decision. The discussion has come about again uh, because there are significant savings to the organization and to taxpayers by organizing elementary students by grade level. And the next slide uh, will show and highlight some of those financials that uh, Enrique Catalan can uh, briefly update us on. Yes, good evening. First of all, Joe, I want to say that uh, we also added $2 million to our pilot over the over two years, over $2 million, close to three, by advocating directly to Entergy. Uh, we signed the agreement past June, and our 2021 and 2022 pilot went up by close to $3 million. So in that sense, And we were successful with. Here I'm just giving you a summary of uh, what we're expecting. And we, I stopped in 2025 because that's when um, our pilot payments get reduced to only 10% of uh, what they were last year. If you can see some programs that need status quo and things on plan. Uh, okay. the difference, the difference um, in the cost of one against the other and in the tax increases. Obviously, 2021, uh, it's the same because we decided not to go on the Princeton plan or we didn't have the time to make that decision. But starting in 21 22, you can see that uh, the cost of going to Princeton plan is about $2 million, $2.1 million less in total expenses for the district than if we, if we stay on status quo. So 82.2 million again, 84.3, which turns out to be a difference of, instead of a tax increase of 7%, that would be a tax increase for, of 4.86%. En Enrique, real quick, we're having we're having some audio troubles. I don't know if you can readjust your your computer or your microphone, but you're coming in and out a little bit. Oh, sorry, no. Okay. I... Can you hear me now? That's a little better. Yep. Okay, I'll get closer to the computer. Um, so basically, for the year twenty one twenty two, that it's the first year for 
the, if we decide to go to the Princeton plan, uh, our tax tax levy increase will be of 4.86% compared to 7%. If you see the third part of the of the worksheet, you can see how the difference between one and the other one. First, you have the difference in proposed budget. The first year will be $2.1 million, 2.2 the following year, et cetera, et cetera. And then the tax levy will be a difference of a million dollars, 2.2, 3.3, etc. So in that sense, you can see that the district will save a substantial amount of money just by going to the Princeton plan. And that's where um, my part of the contribution to this presentation goes because then uh, Margaret and the rest of the people who deal more with the students and understand curriculum better than me can explain how this plan is no different and sometimes it's better than the neighborhood schools. Just to say the last thing, uh, I came to I came I came to Henry Hudson 14 years ago from Amityville. And Amityville had the Princeton plan. It was a highly diverse community, more than ours. And it worked back there. Back there it worked very well. And it's still working well. I'm still in touch with some of the people. And from my standpoint, but it's not much about uh, uh, with the understanding of the curriculum, is that one is as good as the other one or probably better, but I let the rest of the team discuss that part. And, and before we go there, I just want to uh, emphasize for folks, how, how can uh, organizing students by grade level create this sort of savings? The, the answer is efficiencies. Um, the more students you have in the same place at the same time receiving the same services, you can be more efficient. You, you need fewer people to deliver the same service. And that sounds heartless to say as an educator, but it's just simple math. For example, our elementary schools are staffed uh, based on how many students live in that neighborhood at that particular time. And depending on how many students we have in first grade moving to second or incoming kindergartners, our only strategy is hope. We hope that we don't have too many that come in where we have to uh, have additional or, or, or budget, I'm sorry, hire additional teachers that are not budgeted for. And we can't control for equity reasons. Um, based on our current model, uh, class size is completely contingent on how many students live in a particular neighborhood at that time. And we've had issues and the board is well aware of them and the families are aware, well aware of them. That in school A, uh, kindergarten class size might be 24 children and in school B, kindergarten class size is 12 because that just happens to be how many students live in that neighborhood at that time. And we have the conversation around equity or why is that fair? Or why does school A have lower class size or higher class size than school B? We can't account for that and we can't control for that because the model that we have is based on uh, where families live and how old their children are. It's the same reason why um, we don't have K to 12 schools, we have middle school and a high school so that we funnel into those buildings that are typically bigger, uh, but those schools are more efficient because there are more children at the same place at the same time that need that service. So the, the concept of the Princeton plan by housing students by grade level and they move through their elementary experience that way creates those efficiencies. How do you account for about $2 million in reduction? It's staff. Uh, we are a staff heavy business, not just Hendrick Hudson, but public schools in general. Um, close to 80% of our budget is people because we need people to deliver the service. Um, the reality is the models that we have with current class size and projected class size is that if students were uh, in a Princeton plan by grade level, 
we would be able to create more efficiencies and more assurances for families that their children in third grade or fifth grade or kindergarten are all going to have class sizes that are equitable, maybe not equal, but certainly equitable, and that their the range of class size would be much more narrow, not 24 in one place or 12 in another. Uh, and it's important to underscore that, that, that it's, a, it's a calculation of efficiency um, that is driving this conversation. And now we're going to pivot and talk about some of the educational opportunities um, that could be afforded uh, if we went to a Princeton plan. And I'll turn it over to Margaret for that. Hi, everybody. Uh, so there are a lot of things to consider when we look at programmatic impact by going to grade banding in the elementary division. Uh, it allows for not just more efficiencies in terms of economies of scale, but the opportunity to deliver a program targeted to a specific audience. And by that, I mean the students and the age ranges. We can talk about everything from the simple building environment um, that is provided for kids as they move around from one classroom to the next to specials, even outside on the playgrounds. Many, many opportunities to address younger students, middle-aged students, intermediate level students getting ready for middle school transition and to make that building feel dedicated to those grade levels. It impacts things as simple as a classroom and a school library and as a complex as the professional development that we deliver to that staff. Um, the collaboration by having an entire grade level team housed in the same building is offers so many more opportunities than we struggle with now, especially having three schools with different time starts and ends, trying to get people across town for meetings, et cetera. Uh, I, I lived through this experience as a teacher in Peekskill many years ago when they went Princeton plan. So I understand firsthand the impact that it has on teachers and on the planning for program from one year to the next. Um, so you see on the chart, I'm going to read you the whole, uh, the whole, all the notes that are on this piece of paper. But one of the things that I've been stressing with Joe and my colleagues as we've been planning and looking toward the opportunities here is that I understand that there are, there are financial savings to be had here. And those are decisions we will have to make as we move forward and make any potential recommendations. But for me as a teacher and a curriculum person, Aside from the savings that are involved, there's an opportunity to provide a stronger, more cohesive, more exciting program for our elementary students by doing so. So you see at the bottom of that slide, some of the things that are already swirling around in our minds are having a dedicated STEM opportunity for our little kids. We have the, the wonderful exposure to Project Lead the Way at middle school and high school. Well, Project Lead the Way has an elementary program as well. And it would be wonderful to start our kids while their imaginations are running away with themselves to explore the opportunities in their natural physical environment to, to understand how things work. Aren't they curious about that? What makes something go? What makes something stop? Uh, so there are some interesting programs we could look at there. Uh, the, the probably the icing on the cake or maybe even the strawberry on top of the whipped cream is the opportunity to explore the potential for pre-K. Uh, to, to be able to nurture our youngest learners in our district and get them ready for what comes their way in kindergarten and first grade we know right now, and uh, my kindergarten colleagues that were on earlier could vouch for this, that our children coming to us uh, and into kindergarten come from very different experiences. Some go to fully fledged, excellent pre-Ks, and some spend a lot of time at home, mostly alone with adults. There are differences when those children come into kindergarten that take a long time for gaps to close. Uh, we are also, and Lisa will talk about this in a little bit, looking at the potential for bringing our special ed pre-K students with us, again, with the opportunity of building a program from the very beginning. Another opportunity that exists out there, and some of our colleagues in the region have started to do this, is to explore bringing foreign language instruction 
starting in kindergarten. We, uh, those of us who travel sometimes are embarrassed <laughs> at how our lack of fluency in a foreign language exposes us as we uh, galley again about in, uh, in Europe and sometimes see the, uh, the opportunity for our colleagues in Spain and France and Italy to go back and forth from one language to the next. And that's because we, they learn to speak at an early uh, age. Kids in foreign countries right now learn to speak English in kindergarten. Uh, they, as young adults, speak English better than some of us do. So there's an opportunity there for us to explore what foreign language would feel like in elementary. And uh, that's a big conversation because it impacts our foreign language delivery in the uh, middle school and high school. So uh, Melissa Golia, before she left, had many conversations with me about what that would look like. Lastly, but not insignificantly, uh, Janine and Marissa spoke of some of our professional development uh, consultants. We've spent a lot of time and money, especially at elementary in the past few years, bringing in some very, very high class instructional coaching for our teachers around language arts. Uh, we have to plan for sustainability as those coaches, those consultants work themselves out of a job because that is how they work. So we need to start planning for what happens when these amazing people start to pull away and leave us to our own devices, so to speak. What can we put in place to continue that learning, to continue to push each other, to continue to refine our practice? Uh, I think, as I said in our committee meeting, that before Matthew left us to retire, he had put in place the instructional technology coaches. And that has paid wild dividends for us, especially in the past year. Laura took that over and has pushed that program to another level. And it's been a pleasure working alongside her while she's done that. But in all honesty, that same model can be applied to math and reading and instructional coaching at 612. So there's the possibility, again, as we get further into our conversation with the committee and we look at the economies of scale, we do have the opportunity to say, well, we might excess X amount of positions, but hold on a minute, you know, what would the savings trade-off be if we held on to a few of those positions and repurposed some of our staff for some of these roles? So um, I'm excited about it and I will pass the next part of this conversation off to my next colleague. Um, so it was interesting as we, as we get this committee together because I think many people are gonna ask questions about special education. And Joe and I had a conversation today and people are really focused on the transitions, the multiple transitions kids would have to make as they move from building to building. So I think um, we, we're gonna be very creative. We have the staff to talk about how we would support that. And um, Joe and I had another conversation about moving some people around and how can we do that so our kids have a sense of an adult that is the adult that they can go to uh, when they're in wh whichever building, does that adult loop? So these are conversations we will continue to have. But I thought that that was a very, um, I really thought that would be lower than the questions about special ed. So, you know, as far as putting students together by grade level, I, I can only echo what Margaret said, but as the special ed piece of it, when I think about it, we have students in first grade that our program is at one building and they're at another. Parents will A, sometimes refuse to go into that program because they don't want to move their child. So their child is not getting the services that they really need and that's recommended by the committee. The parent will choose something of a lesser value. So if they need an ICT, they're sitting in a class with a resource room because the parents don't want to move them. So having the grade levels actually within the same building would be so amazing for the opportunities for our students with disabilities. Um, and I also think that our teachers loop. So they do a K one, two loop, a three, four, five loop. And having them loop two grade levels versus the three grade levels would be again, such a benefit uh, with all the professional development we've done of learning the curriculum at such a deeper level. You know, K to one isn't so bad, one to two isn't so bad, but when you jump from three to four, that curriculum becomes much, much more difficult and much deeper. And our staff, our special education staff, can't get as deep into that curriculum because they have to know three years worth of curriculum. And we talk about that quite a bit, um, especially some of the committee members that we've had on or just recently getting tenured will say, you know, 
fourth to fifth, that's a big jump, but third to fourth, I, you know, I've got to go back and relearn that. And having teachers only responsible for two grade levels worth of curriculum, I think would be so beneficial. Um, the related service providers, I really think that this would lessen our travel time uh, with our speech, our OTs and our PTs. Uh, it's a little bit, it would be a little bit difficult with PT because she does service five buildings, but having them, having teams in each, having a pod in each building would be very beneficial. It would save on travel time. It would allow us to get into the classroom sooner. So we're actually being proactive instead of reactive. Um, and I think that's a huge piece is that we, um, last year I was able to have the staff to go in and actually look at kindergartners and give some pointers to teachers and actually work with a kindergarten class each week to say, hey, let's work this way to um, lessen the referral. So we got ahead of all that. So having pods of related service providers within the same building would be very beneficial. Um, and I think one of the things that's really important that Margaret shared is our integrated pre-K. If we can look at an integrated pre-K, we pay a lot of money for communities. Um, this year coming in alone, our current kindergarten, I believe is 60 students coming in. That does not mean they're all going to stay classified. Some may get speech, some may get OT. But um, having those 10 to 15 kids in a pre-K program and giving them services before they're getting into a K program, our services are deeper and more thorough than you will find in some of the CITs, the special ed itinerant teachers, or the 15-1 programs outside of our school district because we have the certified teachers, not that they don't have certified teachers, but ours are certified um, usually birth to, to three or birth to six. And we're working with hands-on curriculum. We can get ahead of some of these things sooner. Um, and I think Margaret and I are very excited about this discussion. We've done, we've been doing a lot of research. Where can we find the money? How do we write the pre-K grant? How do we look at integrated grants? So we've really been digging deeper, but I think we would be able to offer such a much more comprehensive education pre-K on, and to be able to offer the, the services to be more proactive than reactive. Um, and, and I can't say what Margaret said is to repurpose people, because as you know, we had many students move in this year. And I had shared with Joe today, we're probably going to have to increase staff because of the number of students moving in. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't work on those pre-K kids and actually lessen those referrals when they hit the school district. So, you know, those are the benefits that I see. Um, and then we would work on a transition plan. And I think we could have it pretty solid before we went to a Princeton plan if we do go that way. And, and I just wanna echo as we transition, John's gonna walk us through some community and um, staff feedback from a survey, but I, I just wanna echo what, what Margaret and Lisa said is that by, by moving, by the, the potential of moving to this model frees up some resources. Now, of course, this is a conversation that's being led by finances and to not have huge tax increases, um, but it's also an opportunity to strengthen our programs and, and stand out and be unique among our peers. Um, we, we could build a dynamic elementary program in this model that we could not sustain with three elementary schools uh, operating uh, K through five because the efficiencies are not there. And part of the conversation that I know I've had with members of the PTA earlier today, for example, was that while this may be a stressful proposition uh, and, and children moving or no longer having their neighborhood school, the opportunity is there um, to be able to give back or to build upon our successes and find opportunities to strengthen our program so that it's a little bit more palatable. Uh, and that perhaps the, perhaps the, the, the tension is not to uh, reduce all the staff and save all the money, but to reinvest in some of those folks and to repurpose as Margaret and Lisa have said, some of those positions um, to build programs that we otherwise wouldn't be able to afford or that right now have, haven't been on our radar um, because we're worried about the number of classroom teachers we need to make sure that we don't have 27 kids in a classroom or that, uh, you know, we hope we get more kindergartners at, at school X because right now they only have 11 kids. So that's the, that's the thinking behind this is that 
we will have an opportunity to repurpose some staff while reducing the budget, which decreases the potential tax increases uh, that Enrique had showed you. Okay, so I'm gonna spend the next couple of minutes just reviewing the, the survey results. As the board knows, we've surveyed both the elementary staff last June and this past October, we surveyed the community. So the slide that's up now just talks about the number of people who responded to the survey. So I'll give you a second to look at that. Now, as you see on the bottom there from the community survey, 91% um, of the responders are current um, Hendrick Hudson parents. Um, we had uh, you know, obviously a high number of elementary parents that uh, participated in the survey, but also a large number of the other parents who also voiced in their opinions about the, the move. So if we can go to the next slide. So the way this slide is set up, the question that they were asked is up on the top. Now, I just wanna remind you that both the staff and the community received the exact same questions. So on the top is the question. On the left-hand side are the answers that they could pick from. They were supposed to select from three. And I have start on the right-hand side, the ones that both sides, both the community side and the staff side were very similar in their results. So again, I'll give you a chance to, to go through those. And Joe spoke before about the balance of class size. That's one of the areas that uh, was highlighted. Flexible scheduling, as you can see also um, common curriculum. Now, similar to the SWOT analysis where you look at your strengths and your opportunities, and then you look at your threats and weaknesses, what the district wants to do is maximize the benefits of the plan if we do decide to move forward. So how can we maximize um, you know, the common, you know, the, some of the things that are on here that uh, like the flexible scheduling and all those kind of things. So we're going to take advantage of that if we were to move in that direction. Now, I also want to point out there's an asterisk of the shared resources. So again, you can see that's one that the parents and the community members rank relatively high. So we don't want to lose sight of that as well. Next slide, please. So now we're talking about the social and emotional benefits. And again, I'll give you a moment to look through them. Now, Greg, I don't know if you can slide that screen up just a little bit because I'm, I'm not seeing the bottom of my slide. There you go. Well, I don't know if you can pull it off, but yep. So again, I've highlighted three of the areas. And I think the one that really stood out for me is the one at the bottom where students develop a diverse group of friends. So clearly students coming from all over the district in the same buildings, it prepares them as they move through up into the middle school where currently right now, the students who are in one school all filter into the middle school at one time with the students from the other school. So um, having worked in the district, I know that that sometimes can be challenging. And then also, as you can see in here, some of the other areas that uh, we need to look at benefits and trying to maximize them. All right, next slide. So Lisa just talked about, you know, what do you do when you have a challenge? And she was talking about the transitions and working with her team. So these next couple of slides, we're gonna talk about the challenges of the Princeton plan. And, and I'll again, give you a couple of minutes to look at this, this slide. So on the educational challenge side, one of the things, and we may have an opportunity to speak about that in a couple of minutes, that you see here is the longer bus drives. Obviously students going from one end of the district now that was their elementary school to the other side of the district, it's gonna be a longer bus drive, but I think we can talk about that later. Um, so that was a major concern. Um, another concern that you can see is the less opportunities to learn from older students. So again, these are challenges and how can we overcome these challenges if we have to move forward with the Princeton plan as best we can, right? We can't shorten the bus drive rides uh, necessarily, but we have ways to potentially um, address some of these other challenges. Now, I wanna also point out on this slide, the two asterisks that are different between the community and the staff. Um, on the upper right-hand side, you can see where the staff is saying that they, they're gonna have these decreased opportunities to work with the other grade levels. So again, this will be a challenge that Margaret would take on and provide opportunities during the course of the year to get the teachers to collaborate together. And then on the left-hand side, um, halfway down on the community side, parent involvement and a decrease in parent involvement. So again, we're gonna to have to try and overcome those challenges and try and make opportunities so we can increase the parent involvement and not allow it to decrease and increase the number of opportunities for the staff to collaborate at the different grade levels. Next slide. 
So these are these social emotional challenges. And again, I'll give you an opportunity to look through them. So the three that were starred, um, developing long-term working relationships with families, definitely gonna be a challenge. Um, the changing in the support staff provided through the, for the students. Again, Lisa touched upon that before. And then also the transitions from the, between the different school buildings. Okay, last slide of mine. So one of the things that we um, got from the survey was some common themes and some common questions that came up from the participants. And you can see the different questions here. And what I will share with you is based on the questions we got off of the survey, but also the great work that the committee did, we are putting together frequently asked questions that will be ultimately posted up on the website. So we're developing that right now. Um, but again, I think it's important as we try to move forward to stay as transparent as possible, give people opportunities to ask questions, try and get the best experts, which you have in the room, um, to answer those questions to the best of their ability. And then as we go on to our next steps, one of the things that's going to happen is the different subgroups are going to have the opportunity to go out and ask these questions of the district that are currently using the Princeton plan. How did they overcome them? How did they address these particular questions? Okay, I'm going to pass it back over to Joe. Next slide. So I'm going to talk quickly about uh, transportation. I'll have um, uh, in, Enrique join me if I screw anything up, but what we wanted to make sure we did is have a, a independent third party look at our transportation uh, model for moving to the Princeton plan. We know that in the past, the district considered the Princeton plan and apparently uh, transportation costs were, um, were too excessive, but uh, we had a third party review of looking at potential uh, Princeton plan configuration. And what we have found is that actually our transportation model right now is not very financially efficient. Um, that because of uh, the number of bus runs we have within one and a half miles from their school, we're only receiving 81% aid. Now, New York, State, uh, New York State Education Department encourages school districts to implement a walking policy for children, elementary, middle school, and high school. They encourage it in a way by uh, withholding state aid and that uh, you cannot receive state aid for miles that buses travel within a mile and a half from a school. So our current uh, transportation system is is not financially efficient because uh, we have so many bus runs that are that are really close to the building within a mile and a half. Under the Princeton plan, uh, certainly kids are going to be on buses longer. They're, they're, that is no secret. Um, but we would increase our transportation aid by about $100,000 being conservatively. So uh, our transportation consultant worked with our transportation department, modeled some uh, bus runs from one end of the, to the district, let's say to BV and from a BV area to Furnace Woods. The good news is we know how much or how long those bus runs really are right now, because if you live over by Hemlock Hill Farm uh, in, in Cortland Manor, um, we have buses that go to the high school and we know approximately how long those bus runs are and we can estimate how much longer or shorter those bus runs would be going to BV. They could be shorter based on whether they go down Maple Avenue and through Peekskill, what have you. We also know how long a bus run would take if you live uh, uh, by the river uh, near Croton, uh, and our school district boundary because we have buses that go to the middle school. So we have an estimate of how long those buses would take to get to Furnace Woods, for example. Um, as you see at the bottom, ride times would, would increase, uh, average ride times to around a half hour for those students. Um, currently, ride times are anywhere between uh, 12, 18, or 20 minutes. Uh, but in terms of resource demand, because this is important, you know, well, do we need more buses and we need more drivers and it's going to be cost prohibitive? 
Uh, the analysis suggests that we don't. The analysis, uh, analysis suggests that we have enough staff, we have enough buses uh, to make that happen. Now, what we will need to do is we'll need to spend a little bit more money in terms of fuel and maintenance because the buses will be driving further and longer, so more gas, more maintenance. So uh, we're estimating, again, based on this analysis, that we actually would save money in terms of transporting students to around $80,000. Now, um, the next step in the transportation analysis would be to identify a school for K-1, 2, 3, 4, 5, put students into um, the transportation logistics system and run potential bus routes. Uh, but as a rule of thumb, for the most part, the rides from one end to the other would be approximately the amount of bus time kids would be going uh, to the middle school or to the high school, you know, with within a within a few minutes, especially, you know, the the difference between going to BV compared to the high school. But this was um, a pleasant surprise that we found because I uh, we never really anticipated what the uh, increased revenue could be from uh, state uh, state transportation aid. Okay, Greg, thank you. So our, our next steps, uh, we received, as, as John said, through uh, our meeting format, we broke into uh, breakout groups a number of times and we asked uh, for some feedback. And the feedback um, and the questions are being divided into really three specific categories. One is uh, educational programs, uh, talking to other districts about uh, what the curriculum and instruction and uh, teaching and learning experiences for students, transitions and supports. This also would include uh, special education, but mostly around social emotional uh, opportunities. And as Lisa mentioned, um, student well being and transitions. And then third, parent involvement the impact on parents. Uh, how do you have a PTA if you're only in school for two years? Or how do you uh, make sure that you have parents involved if they have children in multiple schools? You know, I have a first grader and a fifth grader and they're not in the same building anymore. So we have asked our committee members to self uh, select a group or, or two. Uh, we have team leaders that will lead those advisory teams or task forces and will identify other uh, school districts in our region that we could talk to and ask those questions, colleague to colleague, parent to parent, teacher to teacher, so on and so forth. Uh, and really the goal is to see, can we do this here? And will we be able to um, create more educational benefits for our students than in the model that we currently uh, we currently offer. So we're in the process. I just sent a reminder email to the committee to, to let me know what uh, what group they'd like to be on. Uh, uh, John McCarthy and, and Lisa and Margaret are identifying school districts um, and schools in our in our area that we could do some virtual field trips with and set up some appointments um, so that we can connect the folks with questions with those who do it uh, and quiz them a little bit and learn more about their model and then continue to provide updates to the committee and ultimately come back to the board uh, at some point after the new year um, with a recommendation of, of whether or not we feel that this is beneficial and whether or not we feel um, that we could pull this off. So that was a lot to uh, a lot to digest. A lot of information we've been we've been talking about in our board meetings and with our community for a while. But uh, I'll echo what John had said earlier. It was important that that the board and the community see uh, what the committee did uh, and and understand some of the discussions that we had with them. Certainly, there are a lot of questions. Um, we're going to again uh, have Q and A's that will go up on the website. Um, we'll have a Q&A from those uh, virtual site visits to make sure everyone has all the information. Um, but this is a, you know, a major undertaking. Uh, we're doing it in the middle of a pandemic uh, while some students are home and some students are coming in. Um, and we did hit pause. We had to hit pause on this project because uh, public education was, was turned on its end uh, pretty abruptly last March. And uh, again, over the summer as we planned for this year, but we knew that uh, while we were managing our current environment, we had to keep our eye on the future and keep that momentum and keep that conversation at the forefront. Um, I think what 
you know, what, what I'll end my, my commentary with is we have a number of stakeholders in our community. Uh, we have parents, we have business owners, we have residents that are no longer parents or residents who were never parents. Uh, and there's a, a great amount of stress and pressure on the school district and on the school board to make sound financial decisions that will not impact educational opportunities for kids. And we have enjoyed uh, for 10 years in a row, an average tax increase of 1.04% in our community. And that was based on a very aggressive um, pilot agreement with Indian Point. And that is no longer going to be our reality. And as we saw each of the last couple of years, but particularly last year, um, a growing uh, sense from the community that the district needs to find ways to tighten the belt uh, and to make sure that uh, we don't tax people out of their home um, while maintaining academic excellence. And we are already a very lean district. Uh, we've already done a number of, of, of things that this board and community is well aware of to tighten the belt that does not impact educational opportunities for kids. Um, and we're running out of those areas, to be honest. Um, there, there's on, only so much belt tightening you can do before you have to really uh, look at some of the, the big ticket items um, that may change the trajectory of our school district. But our job is to make sure that if we do that, we do not hurt the educational opportunities we're affording our kids. And, and um, this is one avenue for us to consider. Um, not everyone's going to be on board. Not everyone's going to agree with it, whether it's the process or the communication or how the decision's made. Um, but we owe it to our community to, to turn over the stones and ask the hard questions. And ultimately, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. But um, we, we believe we're doing it the right way. It's not perfect. Uh, I'll, I'll end this commentary with how, how John started that, um, you know, we were 11 days away from kicking off this committee work in a, uh, in a, in a, in a big room with a lot of chart paper and facilitation and getting to know each other. And that's just not our reality. So certainly um, it was not ideal, but it's, it's the best, uh, the best we can do right now. And our financial situation is not on hold just because of our current um, uh, situation right now uh, with COVID. So it's important that we, we do two things at once that we can perfect the model we're in and prepare for, uh, what the next iteration looks like. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. It was an excellent presentation. Um, our financial situation is actually more dire because of COVID than it was before, um, rather than the same or less. Now we've had to delay the start of um, the Princeton plan task force meetings. Um, have you had to skip any steps or chop anything out? I know we had a timeline, John, that you had proposed in the beginning. Have we just shifted it or has it been completely changed? We actually did a little bit of both. I think we did some shifting, but if you remember early on, um, instead of doing a community survey just as a community survey, we wanted to have different opportunities for the community to come together and in focus groups and do that uh, World Cafe model where we can go around from question to question, table to table. That's obviously uh, not something we can do right now. Um, and I also think that, you know, early on, we were hoping to have different groups go out and physically go to the districts and visit, right? And the challenge now is obviously we can't do that because, you know, there's one thing to be in the building and see everything at work and get the opportunity to be almost hands-on with, with the Princeton plan. Now doing it through Zoom is going to present some challenges as well. And as you heard earlier on tonight, some of our districts are struggling with their own issues around COVID. So to try and get partners to be available to meet with us and talk to the staff and talk to the administrator and parents uh, may not be as easy as we think moving forward. Do you think we still have a, a robust um, program to examine this with our stakeholders at um, this time? I, yeah, I think um, if, if, if um, I may, I, I think the challenge is the time frame is gonna be a little difficult to, again, get everybody to be on the same page as far as being able to speak about the educational programs, the special, you know, the special education, the transitions, and having the parents the opportunity to ask their questions. And, and I think we heard from the committee that some of this is feeling rushed, right? And I think that's something I would just caution you on is that we don't wanna rush it to a point where um, 
people don't feel like they really had a good opportunity to really study the issues related to moving to the Princeton plan. Thank you. Does anybody else have questions? Corey? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a few. Um, so the first regarding the survey, um, what insights do you have? Like, were there any surprises based on the results? Like for me, the discrepancy between the, the faculty results and the parent results, that was concerning. Like why, you know, why was there such a discrepancy between the two on some of those questions? And, you know, what other insights did we get from the survey results? Yeah, we flagged the top three, but were you surprised by anything? Were you surprised that something wasn't flagged as a top issue? Well, I think the one that surprised me, and it's a good thing, was the common curriculum, right? So uh, we had actually mm -hmm. talked about that after the survey that I would have thought both staff and the, the parents in the community, right, said this is an opportunity for us to have common curriculum between all the different teachers and all the different grade levels. But that did not rise to the top because I think Margaret and the staff have done a really good job across the board of having a common curriculum, which sometimes is an issue in school districts, whether it's Hendrick Hudson somewhere else, where as kids come from different feeder elementary schools to the middle school, the middle school can sometimes say, well, I think this kid came from that school or this kid came from that school because the curriculum is different. I think um, going back to your point about this, the, the variances, I didn't see that. I, I, we had a couple of opportunities for that. And I think in fairness, some people felt that for the community survey um, that, you know, these questions are more geared towards educators, not necessarily towards parents. So I think like the shared resources answer that I shared with you before, um, I think that just came out of people saying, you know what, 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 what in this is good for our, our students? Oh, they can now share resources. And, and again, we heard earlier with the elementary school and from Margaret's from her previous presentations that I think you guys do a pretty decent job with the sharing of resources. Um, and obviously for the staff point of view, um, there's a lot of concern about how this is, plan is going to happen, right? You know, are the teachers going to be involved in the decision-making process? Um, how is it going to impact the staff? You know, who's going to be moved to which buildings? That, that kind of rose to the top on the, on the staff side. Okay. No, th thank you. I mean, that, that's helpful. I also noticed that um, there weren't a lot of community members who responded. Is, was that by design or was that just we didn't get a lot of people who weren't parents responding. Now pass that over to Joe, because Joe was the one who got the survey out to the community. I don't think that's uncommon, but Joe? Yeah, we, um, you know, we did our traditional email blasts and reminding people to take it, Facebook, website, all of those sort of things. <clears throat> I think school districts have a, have a hard time just by design of trying to reach out to non-parent community members uh, to elicit feedback and input because we don't, we don't have their information. So we try to push out as much as we can and hope that they find it. Um, I, I also, I, I don't know. I'm, um, you know, where some folks may feel like we're in survival mode right now and that the, the educational landscape has been turned upside down and can't focus or can't even think about, you know, something else right now. But um it's, uh, you know, we had high participation in our surveys on our back to school planning, our, our reentry planning. Uh, we had surveys of about a thousand responses each, but that also impacted uh, every family in our school district. Uh, some folks may look at this and say, oh, this is an elementary thing. My youngest is in eighth grade and, you know, I don't need to take it because my input, it's not going to, it's not going to impact me. Okay. Um, so, you know, that would be, those would be some of my observations. Okay. And I just have a, a couple more things. So the first is for Enrique. So that hundred thousand um, in state aid, if we imposed right now without going to the Princeton plan, saying that if you're within 1.5 miles of the school, you don't get busing, would we get that $100,000 now without the Princeton plan? Yes, we had this discussion many times for many years, Corey. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is that our, the streets that the kids will have to walk are very, very dangerous. Okay. We knew this for many years, and it was a board decision that we made probably several times over the 13 years I've been in the district, but it was always the same issue, specifically for middle school, 
and furnace woods, and then you cannot do it for one school and not for the other one. So this has, has been a conscious decision from administration and the board. And we still will, you know, the 100,000, God forbid anything happen, is nothing. And you know that those streets are very dangerous yeah. for children to walk. No, I agree. And we, and we know that if we went to this busing model, that you can impose that without impacting the state aid? Well, is it a certain percentage that have to be, or is it just anybody? No, 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 no. The way it works, all have the the way it works is by person. So uh, they looked if uh, Corey's children are mile and a half less than mile and a half from Furnace Woods, and they go to Furnace Woods. Those two or three kids, we don't get state aid. If now they go to BV, we get state aid. If now we go, uh, so okay. it's by kid, you know, they, we need to show them our transportation uh, program and see kid against school and they check if it's mile and a half. Yeah, okay. So, it's, so we're just saying there would be a lot fewer, there would be a, a, a smaller number of kids that would be within the mile and a half. Eatable, exactly. Okay, got it. Okay, and then my last question is more of a comment is that, you know, we're talking about saving money here. And that's one of the primary reasons to go to the Princeton plan. Um, and, and I saw a slide tonight where the first thing we talked about is, well, let's spend that money that we're saving on other programs. And I think that we need to be really careful about spending <laughs> money on new programs before we even realized any savings from doing a Princeton plan. So, you know, I think, I think we should be careful about talking about pre-K and talking about other things where, yeah, that could be great one day, but that means we're going to have to spend more money on that program money, which is very precious right now that we need to be saving. So I would just caution us against talking about those other items. And that's, that's it. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Lisa, I think you had your hand up as well. Um, I was just wondering about the timing on getting results back and comments back from people. Um, from your comments, John, it sounds like, you know, we don't want to push this along too much. What would be a reasonable time frame, do you think, to, to really adequately explore this and get the, the answers back that we need from the community? I'm not sure I have an, an exact formula for you there, Lisa. I think it's really, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk going on, and, and Joe can chime in on this, that he's been speaking with the PTAs for a long time about what's what's happening. But I do feel that just from our sense from the community uh, stakeholder group, that they're really anxious to get actively involved in looking at this particular um, model. Um, we, we've heard all the financial things about it, but I think, again, going back to your mission statement, one of the things you want to make sure is that you're providing high quality programs for the students, right? So uh, for people to feel comfortable with that, looking at the Princeton plan, I don't know if there's a form to say, hey, listen, one visit makes you feel comfortable. I think um, multiple visits, I just, my concern is we're, we're up against the holidays and trying to um, work with districts that are struggling right now um, could present a challenge for us to really have the access um, that we need to really get the, the community uh, stakeholder group really well versed in the issues around the Princeton plan. So I'm sorry I can't give you an exact answer, but I, I think you know obviously more is better, but you know sometimes more could be too much as well. So I think just finding that right sweet spot so people feel comfortable. Yes, I, I like this plan. It's a good model to move forward. Thank you. So I guess we'll have to play that by ear for a little while and see how things are going. Does anybody else have any um, comments, questions? Bill, nothing? Alex? Uh, Corey, we already heard from Mary Pat. All right, thank you so much everybody for your presentation. It is getting late. We do have next is our audience comments section. And um, then after that is going to be our 
committee reports, if anybody has anything that isn't absolutely urgent for committee reports, I would suggest that maybe we consider just shoving that whole section till next time and doing committee reports next time. So, but first audience comments. Carmen, did we have any audience comments this evening? Yes, good evening, everyone. Carmen, I can't hear you. Oh, you can't, can you hear me now? Oh no. Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, sorry. Can everyone hear, okay. We did receive, I did receive one email today. It was from Janine Heichenholtz. Um, she wants me to read a letter to the board tonight um, from, and I'm going to read the letter. And then there were six parents that signed this letter. So I will read their names as well. And dear trustees, as you all know, the Princeton plan stakeholder committee met last week for the first time. We are members of the committee and feel it is important to share several thoughts with you as the committee begins its work. First of all, we cannot rewind time and change the past. We would like to take a moment to declare our disappointment and frustration that the committee did not meet prior to last week. While we understand that the pandemic caused delays in most aspects of professional life and created significant challenges that the district had to face, the eighth month delay in convening this committee put us all at a disadvantage that words cannot adequately dis describe. Despite numerous attempts by multiple members of the committee to push the superintendent to schedule and hold our first meeting, the fact remains that we wasted months that could have been spent researching and discussing the myriad of topics that this major shift in our educational system presents. Last week's meeting began with a rushed overview of information that has been presented numerous times before, which was a good recap, but which but which shed new, no new light on topics with which the majority of the committee members are already familiar and which could have been shared with us prior to the meeting, therefore not taking up valuable time. As it was, no materials or information beyond what was already publicly available on the district's website were shared with the committee prior to the meeting. The agenda was only emailed out mere hours ahead of time. The new information that was presented was a good introduction to some of the more important topics that the committee will address. But did not delve nearly deeply enough into any one subject. The breakout rooms provided a welcome opportunity for community members to speak freely and exchange ideas, but the short sessions provided and the guided exercises required us, us prevented a true dialogue from happening. Additionally, the lack of ability to provide direct and immediate feedback to the moderator and larger group as a whole left many of us feeling that this was a less of an interactive committee and more like we were in a classroom with our main role being that of listener. We understand that this role is key at the very beginning of any working group. We want to now express our sincere hope that our roles shift very soon into something more active. Finally, we want to express our dedication to exploring all aspects of the Princeton plan, not just its financial impact in our district and make it clear that we intend to fully research and discuss all the ways that we could impact our students, teachers, staff, and community. We do not take our roles lightly, and we are committed to thoroughly examining every related topic before making a recommendation to you as to what we believe is the best course of action. We hope that we will be given the information and tools to accomplish this enormous task, as well as the appropriate time to devote to such an undertaking. No recommendation should be expected nor a decision rendered until this restructuring of our entire elementary educational system has been fully explored and vetted by all parties. Sincerely, Janine Eichenholz, Rebecca Quigley, Dana Goyer, Erica Mills, Christine Arkin, I'm sorry, Arkentucky, Joan Voigt. Uh, we'll, put, we'll put this letter into the minutes. It's been received. Thank you, Carmen. And thank you to those participants for your feedback. Um, I hope some of that feedback was given to John and Joe as well. Um, and I would like to thank everybody on the committee for all of the time and the dedication that you're putting into this. We really appreciate that as a board. And I am very encouraged to hear the dedication that you guys have in really delving into this deeply and giving it your best recommendation. It's very important that the um, members of this committee be engaged in this process and really dedicated to it as you are. So thank you very much for that feedback.
All right, and that was the only letter this evening, correct? Yes, Carol, that was the only letter that came in this evening. Okay, thank you. Um, so that brings us to our board comments, new business committee reports section. It's been a very long meeting. Um, does anybody have anything urgent that cannot wait until the next meeting? Excellent. So that brings us to the end of our meeting. Um, unless, no, I already asked for last comments. I'm not going to push it. Okay. So can, can I have a motion to end the meeting, please? So moved. Nally seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Our next meeting will be in two weeks on Wednesday, December 16th. That will also be our last meeting of 2020. Hopefully 2021 will be a better year. Um, we'll see you all in two weeks.